Okay, we're just going to start right away. So good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 17th meeting of this year of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. And everyone present is reminded to turn off their mobile phones and so on, unless, of course, you're using tablets for uh, the benefit of uh, your evidence and no other uh, purpose, then that's fair enough. Uh, some of the clerks will be using tablets, some of the members perhaps. Um, I have apologies from Claudia Beamish and uh, I welcome Claire Baker as her substitute at this meeting. Agenda item one is uh, the Land Reform Review Group final report and the agenda item today is to take evidence from stakeholders on the Land Reform Review Group and I welcome all the witnesses. Um, first of all, I'd like to go round the table uh, to uh, get you just to introduce yourself, not to make any statements. I remind you that uh, the sound system is controlled by the sound operative. You do not need to, to uh, put on or switch off your own microphones. And if you wish to uh, attract our attention, we will put you on a list and point out that we have a whole range of questions which uh, will allow you to get to your particular speciality. But if you don't, uh, if you help us, um, please, by not seeking to answer every question that is raised by the members of the panel and recognise that this is an early uh, view, as many of you have had, of a hugely substantial report. And therefore, it is not going to be the final word in this committee or anywhere else on this matter, but a very early uh, review with uh, the minister coming in next week to give us his initial thoughts. So, um, starting with uh, Cara Hilton, can introduce herself. Um, Cara Hilton, MSP for Dunfermline. Yeah, I'm Peter Peacock, I'm representing Community Land Scotland. Sarah Jane Lane from Scottish Land and Estates. Uh, I'm Claire Baker, MSP for Mid Scotland and Fife. Alan Laidlaw from the Crown Estate. Uh, Andy Whiteman, writer and researcher. Uh, Dave Thompson, MSP, Skylach Aber and Badenoch. Uh, Cal McLeod, Rural Development Consultant. Derek Logie from Rural Housing Scotland. Nigel Dawn, MSP, Angus North and Moons. Billy McGee, Forest Policy Group. Uh, Alex Ferguson, MSP for Galloway and West Dumfries. Patrick Krauser from the Scottish Crofting Federation. Jim Hume, MSP for South Scotland. Uh, Nigel Miller, NFU Scotland. Angus MacDonald, MSP for Falkirk East. I'm Angus McCall, uh, Scottish Tent Farmers Association. Uh, Graham Day, MSP Angus South. And uh, as the convener of the committee, I'm also the MSP for Caithness, Sutherland and Ross. And uh, I'd like to kick off about the consultation process. We know it's been in three phases. I think the important thing is to get to the final phase. Uh, but members might like to explore, um, you know, uh, th this with you. But I'll kick off by saying, you know, we've had a consultation process. Um, there's been some concern about uh, stakeholders being consulted at the earlier phases, but that there being uh, less direct consultation at the final phase. Um, how do you as stakeholders feel about that? We've had a list from the uh, a land reform review group of the bodies who have uh, been discussing things in the final phase, and clearly that's more likely to be representative groups rather than individual stakeholders. So does anyone wants to comment about that? Well, that's good. Uh, please, Nigel. Yeah. Um, yeah, obviously, this is you know, quite a scholarly document, and it covers a huge spectrum of issues, and some you know, definitely don't impact or, or not directly on our members. Uh, however, you know, there are definitely tri trickle-down impacts on farmers, you know, both land, land or owner-occupiers and tenants. Uh, and I suppose you know, some of the implications on land use affect agriculture as well. Uh, and I suppose we, we kind of felt that you know, some sort of direct uh, consultation with NFU Scotland would have been helpful uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, at an early stage. And in reality, we've never had direct impact on or contact with the group at all, although we asked for it. So you know, we, we have slight concerns we've got to this stage without that. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, Sarah-Jane. We were, we were slightly um, 
criticised in the first stage for having too much um, stakeholder engagement with the, with the Land Reform Review Group. But following the evidence session in, in June from Alison and, and Robin, we did believe at that stage that there would be further consultation during phase two, not just with um, stakeholder groups, but with individuals who brought evidence forward as part of one. And also, um, many of us around the table are involved in, in other review groups, other stakeholder groups, such as the private rented sector tenancy review group that's mentioned in here. And to my knowledge, um, as a member of that group, the, um, the, rural affairs, um, the, sorry, the land reform review group didn't have consultation with those groups either. Okay, anyone else got a point there? Peter Peacock. Yeah, <coughs> I, I take a slightly contrary view. I, I think that um, after the stage one uh, part of the, of the evidence gathering, where we put in written submissions, as did many people, and, where, and had the opportunity of a meeting, <coughs> I inquired at the beginning of the stage two process as to how we would be consulted. Uh, and I was told we wouldn't. That we'd made a written submission and they would come back to us for points of clarification if they wanted to, which they did. We as an organisation developed some of our ideas that <coughs> we'd submitted at, at the first part <coughs> and we simply made those documents available online and I know that they were therefore available to the, um, the Land Reform Review Group. So it, it, to, to, to us it met entirely our expectations of the second part. So, and I think the other thing is we were always aware that whatever they publish would be the subject of consultation. Uh, inevitably, if it was making proposals, both to this committee would consult and government itself would consult. So uh, we have no concerns at all about the, the nature of the process. Just for the record, I want to make, sh make it clear that we've been told at phase two that uh, the Land Reform Review Group met with the Agricultural Holdings Legislation Review Group, amongst others, uh, and that was submitted as a late piece of evidence at our request from last week. Right, uh, we've got Alec Ferguson wants to ask a question. Um, well, I, I feel that I must put on record my own concern that a number of the people who've given us written consultations since last week, uh, and I commend them for doing so in such a short period, uh, many of them have uh, referred to the fact that they have not been consulted at all in the preparation of this report. And I would particularly highlight the uh, evidence from the Scottish Moorland Group, um, who make quite a play of the fact that they have not been consulted at all in the preparation of it. And I cannot help but feel that given the impact of some of the recommendations of the report um, on their area of interest, uh, I, I think it is a serious weakness that they haven't been consulted. But if I may, Convener, I, I want to very briefly just ask you a question, if I may, um, because we, we've had written evidence from Andrew Bruce Wooten. Now, last week I asked um, Alice Dr. Elliott um, if she could tell me why one of her uh, one of the panel of um, experts had seen fit to resign in April, and she said quite understandably that it was a, a private matter. Now, in his written evidence, Andrew Bruce Wooten, because he was the person I was referring to, says that he made a statement to the group when he felt he had to resign. He said, I believe my statement on this subject to the group is available to your committee, but I can produce it for you directly if that is competent. Um, given that statement, may I ask, convener, that we ask for a copy of that statement, because I think we should know why a, 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 an advisor with considerable expertise, in, particularly in landlord-tenant relationships, um, I think we should know why he felt he had to resign from this group. I certainly agree that uh, we can certainly ask for that. He was one of ten advisors, I think, that the uh, Land Reform Review Group had, uh, so uh, that was not a bad attrition rate then, I guess, in a complex area. But we'll find out what he said and uh, add it to our store of knowledge, no doubt. Any other points on the consultation process? Patrick Krauser first, yes. Just uh, for the record to say that, that we submitted our um, written evidence, it seems quite a long time ago. Um, in the second phase of the consultation, they did come back and ask us for some clarification on a particular point. So we're quite satisfied with the consultation process and felt that the, the um, Federation was involved in it. And, and reading the report, um, I think all of the things that we brought up have been addressed for, in some part at least. Thank you. Um, and uh, Andy Whiteman. <clears throat> Thank you, Convener. Um, the report is a very substantial report covering a vast numbers of areas, many, many of which are not even in the remit of this committee. And the amount of work that has apparently gone in to the report um, has taken quite a considerable amount of time. 
I, I'm very aware that um, those who find this report difficult to, to deal with, mainly the landed interest, are attempting to undermine its credibility by um, suggesting that it didn't speak to people it should have done, that it didn't take evidence it should have. Um, an advisor has now come out you know, to, to reveal certain things about what he feels. None of the other advisors have spoken publicly about this, so I, I think one should be very aware that this is a report that has big implications for the future of Scotland and that people are attempting to do what they can to defend their interests, and part of that is to try and undermine the credibility of it. I think you're saying it in a different way from what I was slightly earlier. Um, Claire Baker. Um, thank you, Convener. Yeah, I, mean, I think you know, it has been a wide-ranging report, and I, I have confidence in the consultation process and that it did um, engage thoroughly with people in the first stage. But I think we also need to be mindful that they were working to pretty tight timescales. Um, the government's expectation was a wide-ranging report um, and on a pretty short timescale. And I think we'll have to be mindful of that when they think about how the consultation has been conducted. Uh, as Peter Peacock just said, you know, the, the, any proposals are going to be consulted on and consulted on. Yeah, Sarah Jane. Yeah, can I just, just for the record state that Andrew Bruce Wooten, uh, one of the advisors, actually, he left this group before the report, he had seen the report before the report was published. So certainly um, him leaving the group um, was in no way an attempt to undermine the report. And he refers to the landed interest. There are many people around this table who have an interest in land in Scotland. Um, and we certainly, as, a, as an, as an organisation, aren't seeking to under, undermine this report or the land reform review um, process, which we've engaged with enthusiastically. Thank you for that. Um, let's get past the uh, initial sort of um, artillery barrage and get down to some of the points. But uh, Angus? Just uh, very, very briefly, Convener, uh, we, we felt that in the, inter in the first stage of the report, we had submitted evidence, and we, f we felt that it wasn't not great account was taken of it, uh, and tenancy matters were certainly sho shoveled off to one side. Uh, we, we were very gratified that the, uh, the, the, in the second phase of the report, they, they took far more account of tenancy matters and did a lot of research into it, uh, and they certainly came back to us for points of clarification. So we were certainly quite, quite satisfied with the consultation process. Thanks very much. I think we'll move on swiftly to the ownership of land, which should... Uh be very useful, and uh, Angus uh, MacDonald's going to lead off on that, and then uh, one or two others. Right, so Angus. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you, um, convener, and uh, good morning again to, to everyone. Um, all, all the panel members will uh, be aware that the review group uh, recommends that uh, the Scottish Government should make it incompetent for any legal entity not registered in a member state of the European Union to register title to land in the Land Register of Scotland to improve traceability and accountability in the public interest. Um, perhaps Andy Whiteman can come in uh, during this section um, with regard to the Land Registration Bill uh, that went through uh, Parliament in early 2012, because if I recall correctly, that suggestion um, had been uh, uh, ruled out by, by the Scottish Government, so I'm glad to see it back on the agenda. But um, perhaps the, the, the panel members could uh, tell us um, whether it's likely to be the most effective way to improve uh, traceability and accountability. I want to start, Andy. Um, yes, but back in 2012, I, I have my evidence here from January 2012, I <clears throat> made the recommendation that it be incompetent to register title to land in Scotland's land register and any legal entity not registered in a member state of the EU. Um, and I made that recommendation after consulting some very senior people in academic law. Uh, and some people in, um, in London uh, who had been raising concerns about the use uh, of, the, of property in Britain to launder proceeds of criminal activity. And this had been raised in a quinquennial review by um, Andrew Edwards of the Land Registry in England. Um, and it's also on the, in the context of the recent EU Council uh, decision to uh, set up registers of beneficial owners of companies in order to, uh, to tackle <coughs> tax fraud and, and, and criminal money laundering. Uh, I'm very clear that what this recommendation is talking about, there was some discussion last week, I'm aware, from uh, Jim Hume about legal entities. I'm very clear that from the, the argument that's presented here that legal entity in this respect means legal person, 
It does not mean natural persons. Uh, and that was certainly never my recommendation to the Land Registration Bill in 2012, so that an American citizen who wants to own land, a house or a, a shop in Scotland is perfectly free to register a title in their own personal name. That's not a problem at all. The key issue here is to introduce transparency and accountability. So I'm dealing with an issue just now, I'm dealing with many issues where the owners are in Grand Cayman and Jersey and places and you go around in circles trying to find out who actually owns it uh, and you never get anywhere. So bringing it onshore into the EU brings it into the scope, within the scope of EU company law and makes sure you have accountability because EU law in, in all member states <coughs> has open registers where you can see who's responsible for these companies. Very good. Jim Hume wants to come back. <coughs> Uh, Andy Whiteman na named myself there on a, a point I was exploring last week in the, ra the Land Re Review Group because I, 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 I <coughs> pushed this with them uh, regarding you know, would it be, uh, are they considering somebody from out, out with the EU if they're wanting a building plot and, and, and they were quite clear that yes it would be uh, a building plot too so it seems a bit confusion there but that, the actual review group were recommending that uh, any non-Europeans uh, would not be allowed to own even a plot of building so and I thought that you know, obviously we'd have repercussions if any of us in our retirements want to go off to Australia and have a building plot there obviously so slightly different to what the review group told me on the record just Callum McLeod just now I, I couldn't sympathise with uh, Mr Hume if, if, if that was going to be the issue in terms of individual building plots for individuals that clearly wouldn't be uh, a terribly um, desirable situation, but I think Andy Whiteman's made the, the kind of point there, and that's a crucial point in terms of um, defining what, what a legal entity is in this context. And if we're talking about um, non individuals, and that clearly uh, changes the dynamic in terms of what the, the point of this particular recommendation is. And it is very much in the spirit of accountability and transparency in relation to uh, land ownership in Scotland, which is clearly as I think everybody acknowledges around the table, a, a significant point in terms of, of taking aspects of the land reform process forward. A bitter peacock on this point. Well, the, the, the only point I want to make was that this section of the report just struck me in the way that Callum McLeod just indicated as being about transparency first and foremost, and therefore accountability on the back of transparency. And it, it also fits in a much wider international context with um, the EU and more widely in the G8 or G7 perhaps as it now is, um, talking about um, international money movements, about uh, people hiding assets, doing it for uh, aggressive tax avoidance reasons. Uh, and this is a, th these recommendations are designed to get into that and say, surely it's reasonable in a Scottish context that people who are affected by the decisions of landowners know who the landowners are. And I don't see it as any more than you know, a, a very sensible set of recommendations to try and bring greater transparency. There'll be all sorts of detail that would have to be worked out, but that is detail. Uh, the, the key thing is to try and move on the transparency, and both the register and the offshoring are both uh, important uh, dimensions of that. Uh, Alec Ferguson. You can read it. I, I, I totally agree. I have absolutely no difficulty at all with, with a, a far greater degree of transparency and openness about who owns land in Scotland. And I, I think the practices that have been referred to um, of hiding these in offshore accounts and through companies and all that I've said is abhorrent. Um, and I think it's absolutely right. To sure. But what I think this little issue highlights is uh, something that really worries me about several aspects of this report is that uh, a, a proposal has been put there in black and white without being fully thought through. And it really bothers me that a number of these things, and I accept they're all to be further consulted on, and I hope it'll be, I hope the consultation will be a lot more thorough than some of the thinking that has led to the proposals in this report. Dave Thompson, just now. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Uh, I, I think it's the job of, of this committee to take, take things further. What you have here is a comprehensive look at issues that need to be dealt with. Uh, recommendations, yes, but plenty of consultation to, to come yet before anybody makes any final decisions on this. So, and the Land Re Reform Review Group themselves, you know, make it very clear they don't see themselves as experts, but they've looked at this very, very big subject area. They've come up with general directions they think we should follow. It's up to us now to take this forward and then ultimately the Scottish Government. Uh, in terms of, of the, the registration of land and so on, um, maybe to move it away slightly from the legal entity issue, uh, the, the government have said they want 
And this is a fundamental thing because without knowing who owns the land, an awful lot of the recommendations in here cannot be followed up. They say they want uh, public land to be fully registered in five years and all land in ten years. What I would like to know from uh, members of the, of the round table here is, do you think that's quick enough? Should we be looking at a shorter time scale? Should we be looking at putting additional resources into registers of Scotland if necessary? I'm sure there are a lot of architects and quantity surveyors out there who suffered during the recent recession who might be looking for work as well in terms of pulling together the information that would be required for registration. So is 10 years and five years right, too long or too short? And, and if you don't think it's right, what would you be recommending to us would be a realistic um, timescale for, for this registration? Um, we'll start with Alan Laidlaw and Sarah Jane Lang, and uh, <coughs> others can come in. Thank you, Convener. Um, Certainly. On the, uh, on the matter of uh, transparency, I would agree that knowledge of information of who owns what is, is very important, a significant part of... The role that we play in Scotland is informing that debate regarding our foreshore interests, for example. We own approximately half of the foreshore, and every day, more than once a day, our office is contacted by somebody who says, do you own this piece or not? And we're able to clarify that for exactly the sort of investigations that Andy mentions and for the reasons that Dave outlined. Um, we've been working on this process for the last couple of years with the registration bill. We've been in, in long discussions with the, the registers of Scotland. Um, we note the Minister's um, position over the five and ten years. We've already written to the Minister to say that we support that view, uh, and we've already spoken to the Keeper about working through that timescale, subject to the resources being available. Uh, to answer Dave's next question about you know, appropriateness, it's, it is about resource and time. This is not a simple matter. It does take time. We have experience of working with um, land registry down south, and the resource has to be available on both sides of the, of the equation to make sure it's done properly and accurately. But from our point of view, we're, we're committed to, to delivering you know, full registration of our assets in that time frame and hopefully before if resources are available. Is there a willingness, Sarah Jane, to get involved in this process? We already are, convener. Um, if you look at the work that not just ourselves but our members have, have done in the last couple of years, Cluey Estates actually has dedicated staff who currently are working as part of a three-year project with, um, with the registers to ensure that the Cluey Estates land and, of course, all the parcels which have been sold out um, that, I think that's the hardest part, is actually mapping the parcels which have been sold rather than the, out, um, the outline of, of the estate. That's been going on for some years. We have also had discussions with the, the keeper about holding workshops, because Alan talks about very much that it's a, it's a two-part um, process. There's the, the register's work, but there's the work that has to be done by the estates um, and other landowners. And I think there are some out there who think it's a bigger job than it actually is. So we've committed with the Registers of Scotland to holding workshops to try and get this done um, as cost-effectively and as timidly as we, as we possibly can. The 10-year target is ambitious, and I do think it will require further resources. Um, that was to answer that question. Uh, thank you, yeah, Graham D, and then Patrick. Uh, uh, and not to put Sergio Lang on the spot, but if you've already done all that background work, the wheels are in motion, why is 10 years an ambitious target? I think when we spoke to Buclew about their, um, and that's in it, three years just for Buclew, which is agreed between the keeper and, and the estate, ten years for everything else seems ambitious because they, they, they're clearly to, saying to us that the large estates are actually easier to map than some of the small parcels. So thank you for talking about complete coverage within ten years. I'm talking about mapping the, the, you know, all the hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of units of land in the whole of Scotland. And uh, we've got Patrick Krauser and Willie McGee after that. Thank you, convener. Um, as, as you know, the crofters are in the position that they're having to map their crofts. Um, we've pushed for there to be um, support to community mapping because we believe that that's the only way that's going to expedite the mapping of crofts. I think in answer to Dave Thompson's question, whether it's possible within five or ten years, I don't think it is unless we have a concerted effort and put resources to, to um, helping communities, communities to map their assets as groups. I think using the trigger mechanism that's in place now, um, trying to catch individuals 
and get them to map their crofts individually just presents or creates more problems than, than um, solutions solved. So I would push the community mapping again for all of the land though. Um, and if I could add at this point as well that the crofters are paying for the registration of their crofts. And I think if we're talking about um, registering all the land in Scotland, in fairness, everyone should be paying for their registrations, the same as the crofters are having to pay. Very good. Uh, William McGee. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to apologise for persistent coughing. Um, <laughs> my point relates to um, uh, a theme that the Forest Policy Group are particularly interested in, and that is how communities and individuals can access areas of land on the, 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 the forest estate, the National Forest Estate. Um, so in this, I'm only talking about the Forestry Commission. Um, now, we've been in dialogue with the Forestry Commission about lotting, that's breaking up disposals when they come on the market. And it's quite clear from early discussions with them that they have a real challenge. None of their land is on the register at all. And a lot of it is tremendously complicated and to get on the register. Um, and we, you know, five years, I think, is the, the time that you mentioned for, for getting all public land on the register. I think that without a shadow of a doubt that if there were resources to be applied, then they certainly would be, um, they, they, would, they would require that to get this job done in five years. So that would be that. Question, what do you think about this? Forestry Commission sells off some plots for affordable houses and uses the income for that to actually register their oh, land. I, I, absolutely, absolutely. Um, but I, Is that I a think mechanism that, to fund these sort of things? I don't know the, the flexibilities and the mechanisms for money in and out of the Commission, but um, we've been pushing them very hard over um, recent forest disposals and, and to try and trial. We would like them to trial two or three. Um, and whilst they seem to be very keen, the limitations that they bring up are their, um, the, the, the legal work that they have to do in terms of registration. Okay, um, we've got a couple of people, Nigel Don and then Andy Whiteman. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. I'm just wondering whether I could pick up, and I think it's what Patrick Crowns has said, I just want to really want to pick up with panellists whether this is a, an issue about finding lawyers who can write the appropriate deeds or, or, or the right words, or, or whether it's, sorry, they're not deeds, but, you know, write down the right words, or whether it's actually about mapping. Because if it really is about mapping, we have aerial technology that surely gives us a detailed map of the whole of Scotland and accurately enough. And I come back with Patrick's Pat Crowns' point that surely you don't map an individual my patch of land in the west of Brechin. You do the entire estate and you just have to agree where those lines are. Is it that simple? Yeah, um, fair enough. Um, people can comment on that, but Andy Whiteman first. Uh, yeah, <coughs> as someone who's been trying to find out who owns Scotland for 30 years, um, <laughs> It's, uh, it's, a, it's a welcome move. And as you know, in the land registration bill, there was a suggestion to have targets every five years. Um, and, and that was rejected. Now we have a very ambitious target. Um, I think the important thing about this is that to, to recognise that um, the, the Register of Scotland contain legal information on who owns almost all of Scotland. It may not all be in the land register. It'll be in the Register of Seasons. There's a very small amount that's not even in the Register of Seasons because the properties date to prior to 1617. So the University of St Andrews, for example, doesn't have a, a recorded title. I don't think it's a particular priority to get this land register complete in 10 years. I think there's big risks in it. I think it's very ambitious. Uh, I have direct experience of registrations that have been done where people's houses have been taken in and they shouldn't have been taken in. Uh, this is because what land registration is doing, uh, the keeper is giving a state indemnified title Whereas in the Register of Seasons, all the keeper's doing is keeping some documents. And it's buyer beware whether, in fact, they know what they're buying and selling. So I wouldn't want to rush this. I know I've been in discussion with members of staff in the registers. They're quite concerned about this target. And the important thing to remember about the Register of Scotland as well is it's a self-financing agency. It has been since 1982, since Margaret Thatcher came to power, Next Steps agencies. I would be very concerned if the public were to spend money on effectively giving people a very high quality title free when that money could be used to do something else. So, uh, you know, there needs to be a very proper appraisal done of that. What we could do, and I'll be coming forward with suggestions quite shortly, is build a non-definitive register that would cover over 95% of Scotland, tell you who owns it, tell you what its value is, tell you who occupies it. And actually, 
That is what a lot of people want. They don't want the legal register. They just, if they're planning a pipeline or a new motorway or they want to rent some fields or whatever, they just want to know who to contact. So I think the measures we can undertake to do that, and particularly what's good in the report is they talk about a national land information system. We're wasting an awful lot of money at the moment. The, the Scottish assessor keeps their own data. The land register keeps their data. The Scottish Government keeps their data for Agriculture Administration. Scottish Water and all the utilities have own, all their own data. I've been looking at maps from the old Hydro Board, from the old Hydro Board from the 60s. They're the most detailed maps on ownership and occupation in Scotland I've ever seen. Um, all this information is there. We could actually build it within two years. We don't need to rely on the legal register to do all the vast amount of work they need to do to make sure that every single line is correct. Because if they're not correct, you're talking about large sums of compensation because people's land is effectively being stolen from them if they do it wrong. Thank you for that. Um, Alan Laidlaw. Nigel's question. Um, I sit on the RICS uh, professional group for, for Scotland and the, the interpretation, as Andy says, of the legal position uh, against the maps is, is the key point of, of detail. Um, and some of these maps are going back for, you know, very, very long times when they weren't on a <coughs> digital GIS and the width of a quill is 100 metres on the ground plus. So that's the, the detail of the interpretation of OS data today versus a title from, uh, or a plan from Historic is, is the point in, in detail. Um, I agree with Andy that, um, you know, a lot of this information is already available. The report highlights that I think something like 85% of the data regarding farm uh, IAX plans, et cetera, is already included. Andy's alluded to other systems that are available. Forestry Commission and SNH have pretty handy GIS system that you can go into what's in my backyard, click and see what grants are being paid, what environmental schemes are running and what have you. Um, I, if they've got that data, they have another layer of, of granularity below that. And I think, um, uh, speaking from our point of view, there would be no issue at all for most of the, the larger landowners who mo most people know anyway of having a, just a plain GIS layer that, as Andy says, you can click in to say, who do I phone if I've got an issue? Okay, and uh, Claire Baker, followed by Nigel Miller, called, followed by Patrick Krause and uh, Sarah Jane Lang. So. Um, thank you, convener. It seems when we talk about the register, there's two issues. One is about collecting information on what we already know, and witnesses have talked about there's a certain degree of information that was all in one place. The other thing that the report talks about is um, about beneficial ownership and overseas ownership. And the report says um, that the change that they propose around EU entities would not necessarily reveal the final beneficiary owner of the EU entity but it would ensure it would be covered by EU law. Is there other, when, we went, when we did the Land Registration Act um, a couple of years ago, there were other uh, proposals about should the register contain information on beneficial ownership. Are there other um, suggestions? Because the report also said this is one potential measure to address the issues of traceability and accountability. Are there other measures that people around the table think would be helpful when it comes to how we identify beneficial ownership? Okay, well, you can pick that up as we're going along, certainly. Uh, Nigel Miller. Uh, thank you very much. Really just responding to what uh, Nigel Don has said and Patrick, um, you know, we, we're totally supportive of, of, of the aims of, of uh, this registration process and transparency. Uh, and as far as most farms go, there is good uh, information or good mapping on most farms already in place, so it, it maybe could roll on fairly quickly. I think Patrick's point is probably you know, quite crucial as far as crofting. I think it is a special case. The reality is there isn't good title on a lot of crofts. Uh, they aren't well mapped, and doing it piecemeal is, is a recipe for disaster. Uh, and I think you know, it, it's, it's perfectly reasonable to say that you know, farmers and estates maybe should carry the cost of, of this process to a degree. But in crofting, I, mean, I don't think that is the case. And it's got to be done you know, in a township basis to get it accurate and to actually you know, sort out the, the inevitable issues on the ground about boundaries which are not well demarcated. Uh, if we actually do it on a piecemeal basis, we're going to create problems. And I think that does mean, you know, unlike other sectors, putting a bit of money into it from... From, uh, from government, uh, uh, and uh, the present process is, is actually going to create problems for us. Thank you very much. You need to come back now, Patrick, at this point. Um, just a, just yep. a, a wee addition, if I could, please, just, just um, to, to restate what everyone's saying, that we do need the information. You know, if we're going to reform Scotland, we need to know what we're reforming. Um, and in answer to Nigel, that 
and as Nigel has said, a lot of croft boundaries aren't actually known. An awful lot of croft boundaries aren't known, which is why um, we have to establish them through negotiation and, and using mediation methods to, to actually get people together. And as Andy said, there's loads of information out there, but to ask a crofter individually to try and find this information is, is almost impossible. So, so again, you know, if we, if we do it as groups, and it's great to note that Registers of Scotland have now, or they're in the process of appointing somebody to support communities, <coughs> crofting communities in, in their mapping. So hopefully we'll, we'll see something come from that. And Sarah Jane like. Just to pick up on the point that Nigel um, made earlier, you asked about you know, which staff have been, or, or where the resources are targeted. Baclou, it, it's GIS mapping um, staff that, that Baclou have taken on. And they would love it to be as simple as, as, as I said earlier, just to map the extent of, of, of the estate. But, but I think all landowners, and certainly that, the landowners' organisation, it's quite committed to, to transparency of ownership. And we have said before, you know, what matters most is, is who occupies the land, who to contact, who's making the decision. I'm very surprised to hear Andy, Andy Whiteman saying that that's what he's after because earlier he was talking about the fact that you need to find out who's behind that, who's behind that company because surely if what we're talking about is who makes decisions, who to contact, it isn't that, it isn't that hard. And it could be on a, on a land register light, so to speak. And I think everyone around the table is, is committed to delivering that. Taking up Claire Baker's point. Well, I, I have to say, I think we've looked at the, the EU one. Um, I, I do think it has merit in, in looking at it. Um, as an organisation, we've been quite clear that there, there's no way that we stand up for tax evasion, tax fraud and money laundering that, that Andy's referring to, to earlier, although I'm not aware that there are any evidence that that has actually occurred in Scottish estates. Traceability, transparency and accountability are the driving force of, of our organisation. So I, I think it has merit in, in looking at, um, at the EU recommendation. Did you have a final point? Yeah, well, just from uh, Sarah Jane's um, point, um, w would the panel believe that uh, if, if this were to go ahead, and clearly there's a lot of work uh, to, to, to go to look into it, would it impact on uh, the rural property market uh, and land prices, <coughs> if it were to go ahead? Andy Whiteman. The land market in general would benefit from uh, a much more streamlined process of land registration and ultimately transfer. I mean, ultimately, we actually want to write out lawyers from this whole process altogether. I mean, you, you should be able to, and you, you can in some countries, simply go online and I, I can sell you my house online without anyone needing to be bothered. Uh, I mean, the whole history of land registration has been a history of the, la of the legal profession blocking it, particularly in England, uh, because it generates lots of money um, for them because they're the only people who know how to understand these complex systems. So if you have simpler systems with simpler, clearer titles, with e-conveyancing, it should reduce everybody's costs. Okay. Dina, could I just... Yes, sir. Sorry, <coughs> for the record, this is something I may not say too often during these discussions, but I entirely agree with Andy Whiteman on that point. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, looking at public land ownership, I think, just now, uh, Graham Day is going to lead. Okay. Thank you, Convener. The, the review group makes several recommendations regarding public land ownership, including ending the Crown Estate Commissioner's involvement in Scotland, and devolving their statutory responsibilities to the Scottish Parliament, reviewing and abolishing where appropriate Crown property rights in Scots law, and the development of a more integrated and ambitious programme of land acquisitions for expansion of the forestry estate. I have to say it also some, in my view, welcome suggestions regarding uh, common good land. I'd welcome the views of the panel on these um, topics. And uh, Alan Laidlaw. Uh, um, we've read the report with interest, and, and I think my, my view personally is that there's a, there's a lot of areas that they maybe don't understand the depth uh, in, in terms of what, uh, what's involved. Ownership of, of assets isn't equal to omnipotent control. We manage the, the assets that we do, and we could do nothing without the relevant consents of regulators, planning authorities, uh, and others. And I think you know, we, we work very hard to make sure that there's a, a community buy-in, and we need to work in partnership with organizations adjacent to us and, and those with interests. I think we need to really be careful not to narrow our thinking too far on this. Um, and we need to be making sure that we're looking to, to meet the objectives of the group, 
about maximising the stake of communities and individuals in management of local assets, about helping communities become stronger and more resilient, and about investing expertise and capital. And I can see that we can bring a lot to, to that opportunity. I think um, there are risks involved in um, the, the de devolution of some of these assets to, to local authorities and to Scottish Government. You could end up um, throwing the, the baby out with the bathwater in some regards. And you could end up in a conflicted position in terms of um, some of the regulators. So you wouldn't hand control of planning and regulation of an onshore wind farm to the landowner who was going to benefit from the receipt. You wouldn't, you know, we see all the difficulties that local authorities get into in terms of allocating housing on their own local authority land or, or making that. So I think the, the distance between ownership and regulator is something that's been discussed quite a lot in the past. For example, in aquaculture, um, there was a conflict between the Crown Estate being owner and regulator of aquaculture, something we pushed to change back in probably 07, took a number of years to do so because you end up with a direct conflict with somebody consenting an activity um, into, and then benefiting directly from, from that. I think also, you know, we are doing a lot to, to work with communities at the moment, and I think one of the things we have to look at is the Coastal Communities Fund and the flow of funds back to that uh, and the work that we're doing with other communities. So I think there are areas where we need to improve and we need to work uh, more collaboratively, and we're working really hard on that. I think there are areas that people maybe necessarily don't understand how complex the seabed and foreshore areas are and don't realise the number of different competing interests that are happening on the ground. Um, and, you know, you can easily stand on the foreshore and think it all looks quite simple out there, but I can guarantee when you start looking at the GIS planning and, and mapping and, and different interests in that area, you realise that there's a huge potential for conflict and that would potentially stand in the way of the government's targets for sustainable growth of aquaculture, moorings and, and uh, safe navigation and things. So there's quite a lot in there that you need to be very assured that it's going to make an improvement to, to change something like that. Um, uh, Callum McLeod, Peter Peacock, William McGee and Dave Thompson wants to come in with us. Thank you very much, convener. Um, I have to say I find some of that argument slightly perplexing uh, to a degree. Um, the Land Reform Review Group uh, actually, in its formal recommendation, talks about devolving the Crown Estate's powers to local authorities, but it then goes on, and I think Alison Elliott and Evidence said last week that there's a case for devolving beyond that to local communities themselves. And frankly, the idea that it's too complicated, it's too difficult for uh, communities themselves, community organisations themselves, and, and wider communities to actually manage and benefit from the assets on the foreshore and in, in, in relation to where uh, the county state has current governance is, is ludicrous, frankly. Um, Peter Peacock. <laughs> I just wanted to follow up really in, in the same kind of spirit of, of that. Community Land Scotland made a lot of representations to the Scottish Affairs Committee when it was looking at the Crown Estate a couple of years ago, and we argued very strongly that the Crown Estate needed radical uh, reorganisation and reform in its management and operation. And whilst we didn't address the specific question of de de devolution to Scotland or whether it was retained at Westminster, in a sense, we were looking at this back from a community point of view and it, it mattered more what happened at the local level than how it was managed uh, at the national level. We've got no difficulty with that recommendation that it should be devolved. In fact, we can see you know, significant uh, advantage from that. But it's what happens thereafter that becomes important. And I can see exactly why the, the review group are recommending that you could devolve further to local authorities. Uh, and I think that's got a role to play. I think the thing I would like to have seen slightly more emphasised in the report is the latter point that Callum made, which is that uh, we have argued, certainly, that where a community owns its land already, it should have control of its foreshore and an inner zone of the seabed, because you cannot really detach the foreshore and that inner zone of seabed where a lot of economic activity takes place from the land. These are you know, in, you know, absolutely connected. And I, I have to just, I, I regret to say this, Alan, because Alan and I got on very well when we were talking about rugby and so on. But um, I thought his latter comments were patronising towards communities. I mean, don't tell me 
in the in light of experience we now have in Scotland, that people who are running 100,000 acres in South Uist, for example, running a multi-million pound wind farm, developing a 20 million pound harbour development, investing in crofts, investing in the land, that they're not capable of understanding what happens offshore or what the potential is. I think they're absolutely capable. But what's more, they've got a far greater incentive for doing something about that economically than with respect the Crown Estate have. And how the Crown Estate is regarded in many of the communities that our members uh, come from is a distant landowner who simply takes rent on the back of other people's enterprise. And what we're arguing for, and what, the, what I think the committee, the Land Reform Review Group are arguing for, is to turn that on its head and begin to see the incentives to develop being given locally by ownership and by control locally. So I think that the, the direction of travel, again, there's details we worked on, but the direction of travel that is recommended is entirely laudable and to be supported. I'm going to say it was an intercepted pass, and we'll give Alan Laidlaw another try uh, at the moment. I'm, I'm not sure my front row legs will get me all the way to the line, but we'll see. Um, and then, I mean, others. I don't. I've never said what well, you know the, the suggestion that communities can't manage this. I've seen the examples from Peter's members. I've spent time doing uh, you know a lot of engagement with those members and organisations that represent that Peter represents, and, and the, seeing the good work that they do. What I'm saying is that we need to be clear that we're coming a long way to, to, to acknowledge that. We are, with Peter on Friday, holding a workshop with community uh, membership groups to look about how our local management agreements um, that we've developed over the last couple of years, and we've mentioned to the committee in the past, about how we engage with community toolkits. We're also looking at a pilot foreshore sale to, to one of Peter's membership groups to help that local control um, off those assets and that I, I agree that those people on that in that area are very well placed and, and positively behind the, the health and success and vibrancy of that area. We work really closely with community groups. We'd like to do more. There are certain areas that we find difficult to, to get into those community groups. Um, you know, we've worked with um, a number of different organisations on our LMAs, whether it be uh, uh, Portree or Loch Maddy, where we've put capital invested into that area whether we're, it's talking with West Harris or, or Gia and others about p future opportunities. So I'm not saying that you know, we're, uh, we're saying anything about how communities uh, manage that. I think the inshore area is of far more interest. I think you have to be able to mind that we take a, a 20,000 foot view to the strategic importance of, of the seabed in particular. Um, and that's where you, know, you start getting into to, to different challenges um, and it's interesting that the, the Wood Group report on oil and gas talked about you know, collaboration of data and sharing and things like that on oil and gas. They looked at more emphasis on stewardship of the assets. They looked at resource and activity on a regional basis rather than site by site. Um, and you know, in response to that, there's an arm's length body being set up by DEC to manage oil and gas. Now, that's what we do for renewables. And, uh, you know, I think that is, is something that we need to be clear about, that the strategic view at that sort of level is really important to Scotland being successful in delivering on the energy targets and on the economic objectives that we have. So I think there's a, there's a line to be tread between a strategic asset management and local interest and engagement. Now, that's a, a matter for government to choose where that goes and, and how that goes, but I think we just need to be really clear that we can potentially offer the, the best of both in that regard. I will park the Crown Estate issue just at the moment because there's other people want to come in on public land and Willie McGee's first. Thank you. Um, yes, our <coughs> interest um, here is in the, uh, the National Forest Estate, um, as in Section 13, and really we you know, we uh, welcome the, uh, and, and endorse the recommendations that the, the Land Reform Review Group have made. We did find the, the section slightly vague. There was a lot of de sorry, the recommendation vague, but the, there was a lot of detail in the actual, um, in, the, in the discourse. And there's three things we picked up on. How to provide flexibility to lease national forest land. The creation of starter forests, you're all aware of starter farms. I've never heard of a starter forest with the uh, Forestry Commission yet. And diversification of forest ownership through national forest land disposals. Um, we met with Paul Wheelhouse um, as uh, a, a joint group with the Scottish Woodlots Association. 
and after some exploratory legal work, um, the impediment we found was the same as, as flagged up by the Land Reform Review Group to leasing on forest estate. It's the definition of community. That was the, the key element. And we proposed um, a, an amendment to the Public Services Reform Scotland Act 2010, a very minor piece of tweaking, which would not only uh, broaden the member of community that would allow um, uh, groups and individuals within groups um, that were not for profit, that, were, um, that uh, were approved by the forestry commissioners to take leases over forestry, forestry commission managed land um, without changing the Forestry Act. We know that there is a recommendation for a new Forestry Act and we welcome that. That may take some time. Um, the creation of starter forests, we all know that the forest, Forestry Commission, Forest Enterprise, are buying land um, and in their land purchases, um, we're very pleased that they're, they're, uh, they're going down the route of starter farms. We think that new entrant farmers is, a, is an excellent idea, especially for young people who can't get access to land any other way. We would like to propose that they do exactly the same thing with starter forests. There is no such thing um, on the books as yet. And that could be for individuals um, or for groups. Um, and <clears throat> we would also like to um, endorse the recommendation about diversifying ownership. And as they pointed out in the, in the report, one of the easiest hits, if you like, in terms of diversification is through forest. Um, and the Scottish Government has within its, its, uh, its, its power, if you like, the ability to do this acquisition and then disposal or in disposal, sub-lotting. Um, and we've, we've had meetings with the Forestry Commission. They make all the right noises. I think this report um, gives impetus to what we've, um, we've been pushing for. Um, and certainly this opportunity today to give evidence, I think, will be a further stimulus to them to, uh, to take action. We'll be asking the Minister about the state aids issues and the forestry, the, the Treasury rules, sure. which have been also alluded to in this report. Uh, so we will take that up with them. Nigel Miller, Andy Whiteman, Dave Thompson, Alec Ferguson. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, within the uh, uh, sort of report, there's a reference made to the land use strategy and, and uh, uh, you know, the, the you know, that is you know, pivotal in, in determining your know, land use in the future. Uh, and uh, I think repeatedly in the report and in this section as well, there's a thought about land acquisition and increasing the, the forest estate. In reality, you know, the Woodland Expansion Advisory Group looked at this and, and uh, looked at a 10,000 hectare expansion over the next few years. Uh, and you know, that may be disputed, but that's where we are. Uh, it seems strange that at this stage, the Land Reform Group are uh, advocating we go further than that, uh, you know, with more aggressive land acquisitions, and without taking into balance other, other actual strategies. You know, we also look at the the uh, government strategy of Scotland Food and Drink. We're at 5.3 billion exports. We're meant to get to 7.1 by 2017. This is 300,000 jobs plus in Scotland and a major export earner. Uh, and I think you know, to ignore that fact and the balance of other land uses is, 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 is not uh, uh, right at this stage. Uh, and and uh, you know, I, I, would, I would hope that the committee would, would review that, that sort of priority and look at a more balanced approach. Uh, in reality, you know, the, the state uh, or forestry estate you know, amounts to 650,000 hectares. Uh, and if you look at that in comparison to Scotland's farming capability, we're at 800,000 or something like that hectares of permanent grass only and 900,000 hectares of arable land. Now, if we're going at 10,000 hectares a year uh, over the next few years, we're going to have less of that. That's the reality. And we're also looking at increased production. And I think we've really got to accept that our agricultural resources are limited uh, and they're a key part of our future economy and therefore they should be protected. Uh, and there's also concerns about land values. The reality is that uh, forestry acquisition by the state and by private forestry has actually pushed up land values significantly upland areas, without a doubt. Uh, and maybe that isn't a positive thing. And we also look at communities, and we've seen in the borders and in other parts of the southwest and in the north, uh, communities, you know, dying schools being lost because of large tracts of land being taken out. So I think we need a bit more balance in this, uh, and we've got to respect the other strategies and the other reports that, Scott, that the government have actually commissioned. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Andy Whiteman, next. Very briefly in response to that. But very useful, if it is. and in many cases, I'm not singling you out by any means. Yep. 
Um, important for the committee to understand that the Crown Estate Commissioners don't own any land at all. Um, all the Crown Estate Commissioners own is um, Alan's file here, and presumably that pen belongs to his employer. Um, the land is owned by the Crown, and the Crown Estate Commissioners merely administer those rights. And Scotland used to administer those rights up until 1830, when they went down to London. And we're talking about the administration of public rights, public Crown rights, already Scottish public rights. And the Scottish Affairs Committee was very clear in its recommendations, and I think Parliament um, should adopt them. Um, on the Forestry Commission, I think, uh, or, uh, and sorry, also the Parliament could actually nationalise Crown land in Scotland if it wanted to now, under uh, its exist under the Scotland Act, if it, if it wanted to. Um, on, the, on the Forestry Commission, I think there's a big uh, debate to be had, and I think one of the issues about public land is how there can be greater devolution of control, administration and management. And if you look at countries like France, about 30% of public forests are managed and administered by communes. Uh, I think we have a very centralised uh, uh, forestry commission. Uh, Jim Hunter, I remember, described Scottish forestry as being to, the forestry commission being to Scottish forestry, what collectivisation was to Soviet agriculture. So I think we, we could do something very exciting with the powers that the Scottish ministers have in terms of their land acquisition powers, but also importantly to make sure that those are not used simply to increase the central control in Edinburgh, but they're used to revitalise communities. And I think we can build forestry in a very different way than we have in the past. Thanks very much for that. Um, Dave Thompson, Alec Ferguson, Peter Peacock and Alan Laidlaw, and we're going to move on after a final point from Graham, who introduced this section. Yeah, convener, um, j just to come back to the Crown Estate issue very uh, briefly, it was very interesting what, what Peter was suggesting in terms of the, the control for communities that have bought their land. It raises the question, of course, you know, um, others who own land would say, well, if community owners have got that right, what about us? Um, the, the report recommends devolution of, of Crown Estate um, administration, as, as Andy um, says, to, the, to Scotland, to the Scottish Parliament, I'm very keen personally that it does go down um, much more closely, down, down to local communities. And I just wonder um, whether some kind of two-tier system might be you know, the, the, the ultimate answer, with the, the Scottish Government having a certain responsibility for an overview of certain things, and we would need to get into the detail of all of that, but local communities very much having responsibility for dealing with those issues in their own communities. Now, it might be that local authorities would have a role in that. Um, otherwise, you know, you need to define what the, the local communities are. But I think it's really important that we delve into that as we go through, um, you know, looking at this report. And there's going to be a lot more work done on it. This is, these are very much initial discussions as far as I'm concerned. I think we are trying to tease out just where we're going. So just to put it into people's minds that maybe a two-tier system may be the way forward. Need somebody to hold the jackets while uh, people argue about what the community rights are. Alec Ferguson. Um, Convener, I just want to touch on the forestry issue a little bit. Claire Baker and I were both at a CONFOR conference in Edinburgh last week. Um, uh, and two things came out of that, one of which we've had put to this committee before, which is that in 20 years' time, Scotland's forestry sector faces a real crisis in supply um, of commercial timber. Um, in his uh, speech to the conference, the Minister Paul Wheelhouse made it quite clear that the future of the, for the commercial forestry sector in Scotland is very much in the hands of the private sector, uh, suggesting that the purchasing power of Forestry Commission in Scotland is likely to become less and the, the private sector will have a greater role to play. And without wanting to get into Nigel Miller's understandable concerns about farming or forestry, or my own views, it needs to be farming and forestry as much as possible. But I just wonder how both Andy and Willie feel that the recommendations of the Land Reform Review Group, um, as far as forestry is concerned, ties in to those two points I made that came out of that conference. And by the way, I would say I, I very much welcome the first woodlot in Scotland into my constituency. I think that is an initiative that has some future. Before Andy and Willie come in, um, uh, Peter Peacock and Alan Laidlaw. And, uh, 
substantive but, point. <coughs> two or three very quick points. For, uh, on Dave Thompson's point about a two or three tier uh, approach, because it might go to a local authority before it went to a community, for example, that might be a three tier approach. I mean, we completely accept that there is a strategic, and, and with this I would agree with Alan Laidlaw, there is a strategic interest in looking at big offshore and other developments which couldn't be done at a community level and may not even be able, able to be done at a, a local authority level and require to have a, a, a wider Scottish uh, view. Uh, but that apart, I, would, I think that the, looking at it in, in the way Dave Thompson suggests has, has got uh, real merit, I think. I just want to really back up what Willie McGee was saying about the potential of forestry and to break up larger forest blocks for communities and for individuals uh, to be able to develop a future around them. There is real potential there. And I want to, in that context, make the point very clearly that the state aid rules that you touched on, Convener, are a very significant obstacle to this. And I know there's a lot of work being going on and a very helpful decision recently taken where the, the community in Agus have been able to get funding from the land fund, notwithstanding state aid, and hopefully that points uh, a, a, to a new direction. But this really requires work done because we're, we're tying our own hands potentially by interpretations of state aid rules that are unfortunate in, in that regard. Um, so I think those, that, that, take that, that point really needs to be taken seriously where the committee state aid is a very practical obstacle to progress today. I think that's part of a work stream which, you know, <coughs> amongst the many that we're beginning to identify. Uh, Alan Laidlaw, finally part. Thank you, Convener. Um, the, the piece of ownership came up again and again there. Um, I talk about how we manage our assets and how our team in Scotland manage those assets for Scotland. Um, what we do is we deliver due to scale, expertise and diversity. If you look beyond the name of the Crown Estate, there is a model that we believe that delivers broadly uh, in community long interests in terms of long-term value, sustainability, and also preventing these conflicts in, in the planning system, which can really hold up development. Obviously, the Coastal Communities Fund is delivering 22 plus million quid in terms of job creation projects in Scotland between 2012 and 2017. And I think it's that strategic piece that we need to look at, and we are engaging with Peter's members we're looking at ways that we can, to, can get that local input and you know, management down the ground. We've got a, a pilot scheme with uh, Tobermory at the moment where they're looking at their harbour interests and, and that is very much in the grain of what Peter's talking about, about people in the local area having the greatest interest in, in the success of their areas. And I'm 100% aligned with that. We just need to be really careful about the bigger strategic piece and some of Scotland's biggest targets in terms of energy, in terms of aquaculture and the food and drink industry, as Nigel highlighted, you know, there's some really important players in there. Um, and then you get on to things like broadband cables and, uh, and things like that to the islands and, and these key essential services that we're able to take a very long term view on. And I think one of the, the pieces in the report that is of a concern to me is that the, uh, you know, the, the, the report says we take a very narrow focus to what we do and we don't take into consideration what our impact is on communities. That's something I entirely disagree with. Um, without successful communities and activities, you know, we are not successful, and I think it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship that needs to work for both sides. Um, and I think it's something that the, the report has, uh, has missed uh, entirely. Um, I just wanted to tie up the question. I think nobody's answered Graham's question about common good. And uh, if there was something about forestry, then Wally McGee and... Andy, to finish this section off, I just point out that we have 10 questions in our minds that are very broad. Uh, this is question three. On Common Good, Chair, um, I'm, uh, I was the source of the data in here on Common Good because I'm in the process of writing a report on where we're at with it. Uh, and it's also the subject of the forthcoming Community Empowerment um, Bill. Uh, I, I'm, I'm quite clear that uh, you know, what the report says I, I endorse. Um, we need to have a statutory definition, statutory registers, and communities should be able to take back these assets that they lost in 1975. Um, they didn't want to lose them in many cases, uh, but uh, uh, there wasn't uh, much choice. I think communities like St Andrews, for example, got a private act of parliament to ensure they kept their common golf links. And Ochtermachti, North Berwick did, but a lot didn't. So I'd like to see these return to the communities if they wish them. On the forestry, I think we need to have a, you know, there's a, there's a big debate to be had, and uh, I understand Nigel's concerns. I don't think there's any problem in expanding forestry in Scotland without touching on the best agricultural land. We've got vast areas devoted to hunting estates that are, could still be used as hunting estates, but could also be 
extremely well wooded. And I also think relying on the private sector and the way it goes about its business just now is not the most profitable way of building Scotland's forest resource because a lot of the people that own these do, do it for uh, the tax benefits, uh, their investment companies, people living down south, their absentee owners, Russian oligarchs. I'd like to see Scotland's forest resource in the hands of local people, living, resident landowners and communities. And we could get a lot more out of the forest if that was the case because it would be supporting local communities rather than just being a fenced off enclosure, earning someone um, you know, a return. And we saw the returns available for forest just the other week, 9%. Um, I mean, loads of money is pouring into it uh, from accountants in London. And I just don't think that's the way ahead for private forestry. Thank you. Uh, Wally McGee? Uh, Andy's um, said most of what I wanted to say and, and really con for NFU a plague on both of their houses. I worked for 15 years in the Scottish borders um, trying to find a compromise between industrial foresters and, um, and, and farming. And fortunately, uh, many of the farmers that we were dealing with in the, in the valleys um, were not set on maximizing production, but we're rather um, um, very interested in diversification and local development in order to keep those schools full. And our job was to try and find sufficient forest onto their land that gave them diversification of income. So um, I think there is a balance to be struck. I don't think either of the organizations at the moment are doing um, themselves any favor in, in that uh, debate. Leave that hanging in there. Um, <coughs> we'll turn to community ownership as a subject, and there are recommendations to do with this uh, regarding the right to register an interest over land, the right of preemption to buy land, the right to request to buy public land, the right to buy land, the right to request a compulsory purchase order over land in the report. Um, what do our witnesses think about the suite of proposed options? Um, are they sufficiently comprehensive or are they too detailed? Peter Peacock. Thanks very much, Commissioner. I wonder if, if, before I come to the specifics of your, your question, Commissioner, that there's a, something that's slightly grating with me, or not grating, that's putting it too strongly, about the discussion so far. That this report is, is a very comprehensive report overall, but it falls into two really distinct parts. There's the detailed recommendations, which we've been focusing on, but there's actually some very fundamental principles that lie behind that that I just want to touch on, because that's what shapes and makes sense of the recommendations. I'm, I'm going to welcome what, you, what they say about community ownership in just a second, but like others, there are points of detail that I think require to be looked at, as Alec Ferguson's mentioned, as Nigel Don's mentioned, as William McGee's mentioned. But in a sense, that, 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 belie, it doesn't belie, that, that reinforces the point I want to make here, that this report is really changing the terms of debate about land in Scotland. Uh, I mean, Alice Nelly made a hugely important point last week when she gave evidence to you that land is a finite and crucial resource it requires to be owned and used in the public interest for the common good. In other words, land is not just a private commodity. It requires, it's got a public interest. She also talked about the need and the public interest. The report talks about the public interest in having greater diversity of ownership. It talks about the land debate ought to be framed in terms of land ownership as well as land use and not ju you can't just leave it to land use because ownership of land largely determines that use. Now, once you get a hold of these principles, then every recommendation from Community Land Scotland's point of view is part of a coherent whole. Uh, and, and whilst there's a lot of detail to be worked out, it's exactly why they're recommending such a comprehensive range of things, because they're trying to seek to change the concentrated, the very concentrated nature of ownership in Scotland, make it more diverse, uh, and therefore you've got all the detail to help support that. Now that comes to community ownership. I think the analysis in the report about community ownership is both uh, spot on and very welcome. And I think that the person who clearly is behind that, in a sense, within the Land Reform Review Group is possibly the most experienced person in Scotland on the question of community ownership, having dealt with it for 30 years. And so we think they're absolutely right to talk about the simplification of the Land Reform Act in part two, but particularly part three in relation to the crofting right to buy and the mapping requirements, which are you know, significantly too onerous and, and probably very unnecessary. They talk about there still being barriers to community ownership, which I think is absolutely right, there are. And then the menu of rights that they set out, which you have uh, yourself set out, Kavina, are designed to meet those, address those barriers. And again, we've got um, strong support for what they are saying. The actual right to buy, which they have returned quite properly from what it was previously known as an absolute right to buy, because actually it was never an absolute right to buy, it was a highly qualified right to buy. Uh, and the actual right to buy we support if it's in the public interest, and I, I stress that. Um, 
the, 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 the powers of compulsory purchase seem relevant, the powers of compulsory sale orders seem uh, highly relevant. Uh, the emphasis that they place on negotiation as the means to try and secure transfers are also e e exactly right, we think, um, provided there is a backstop power to encourage all of that. Uh, and the community land agency to facilitate those discussions and support the whole process, we also think is absolutely right. So we very strongly support all of these uh, recommendations. There's a lot of detail to be sorted out about um, you know, what exactly would be the process to exercise the actual right to buy, um, how does the compulsory sale order and the compulsory purchase order fit with a registered interest uh, in land and the rights a community would have to an actual right to purchase if, if this went through? Um, would auctioning land under a compulsory sale order be the right way and how could communities actually participate in that? So there's lots of detail, but that's what it is, it's detail. Uh, and that can all be sorted by the committee and by government working on it. But the direction of travel and the specific recommendations uh, seem to us exactly right. My plea would be to act quickly on this, to consult quickly, to encourage government to consult quickly, and then use the coming community empowerment bill to maximum effect to try and change as much as we can of this as quickly as we can. Sarah Jane Lang. Yeah, I mean, I think to, to echo the, the point that Peter made about underlying principles um, being a key part of this, as well as the, the recommendations, but one of the principles which I, I felt was missing in this section was the fact that deciding not to exercise the right to buy is a sign of an empowered community as much as deciding to exercise the right to buy. And I think that's, that's a principle which does appear to be, to be missing from this section. Um, I, I actually also agree with Peter that the establishment of a community land agency should be looked at um, as a matter of urgency, because you have a, a plethora of willing sellers and communities out there who are trying to, to find themselves, you know, the way through the process. It's some, it's some years, I'm not sure exactly how many years it is, since we had the report about how the, bill, how the legislation could be improved, and it's disappointing that, that we, you know, we've waited until now to, to actually um, improve the operation of the current legislation. I disagree with, with, with Peter about some of the elements, unsur unsurprisingly. Um, we have said before, though, that you know, the CPO mechanisms can be improved. Local authorities do have CPO mechanisms. And if you are the own owner of the only plot in a, in, a, in a village which could be made available for housing, and you're not bringing it forward for development, then there are actions which can be taken and should be taken. So I, I think um, there are issues within there that, that we do, do have... Um, have some problems with. I won't get into debate about the, the, the ownership of land, but I would urge the, the committee to, to help the people who are trying to find themselves through this minefield of the current provisions um, to deal with that as, as quickly as possible. Thank you for that. Um, Callum McLeod uh, and Nigel Miller on this section, and then we'll... Thank you, convener. Um, I, I think in... in, in general terms that the fact that the, the report does amplify and make very clear these, these uh, principles in relation to uh, the importance of, of ownership, the importance of uh, the common good and the public interest is, is really important in terms of actually, actually bringing land reform from the margins of public policy where it's been residing, frankly, for the last 10 years to the centre. Uh, and I think overall the report provides a good framework for that. Sure, there are issues around implementation. Sure, there are issues around technicalities. And there will be different views in terms of that. But I think that overarching framework is very important. And I think the institutional framework, which is being suggested, is very important too in formalising that. Um, I, I came before this committee with colleagues um, three, four years ago uh, to talk about the research that we'd done on the Land Reform Act. Uh, and part one was, seemed to be working well. Part two was working. Part three, not working at all. The options which have been suggested, frankly, in relation to um, opportunities for communities seem entirely appropriate in terms of providing a wide-ranging menu. Uh, and there will be different options, as Sarah Jane says, for different situations, of course, but that, that, that breadth of, of um, opportunity and, and variety of options seems entirely appropriate, I would suggest. I think you would agree, however, that allowing the current <coughs> legislation from 2000-2003 to bed in was part of the reason why um, it wasn't front and uh, centre, but that in fact your report two or three years ago began to show up some of the problems that were existing with uh, the ab changes. Absolutely convenient, which is why you're absolutely right, there's a longitudinal element to, to, to that kind of evaluation, but now I think with certainly, you know, there are opportunities to act quite rapidly in terms of aspects of the community ownership element legislatively, and the Community Empowerment Renewal Bill offers opportunities in relation to that. Um, 
I would like to see where within this grand scheme of, of legislative and other kind of institutional elements, the Crofting community right to buy sits as well in terms of amending that, because we need not go into any huge discourse as to the issues that have been around that particular initiative. And, and Nigel Miller. Yes, sorry. Thank you so much. Oh, um, Which is, is uh, you know, touched, I guess, a nerve with some members. The reality is we, we accept there's going to be wider community ownership, and, and you know, that's in the benefit for us all. I think the, the key for us is that the public interest test is robust, and that there's an ability to fund and manage the project once once it, it progresses. And I think if that's the case, then you know, we, we, we must be you know, positive about this. However, you know, there seems to be a real extensive menu, right to register an interest of land, right for preemption, right to request to buy public land, right to buy land, and then we go on to compulsory purchase and then compulsory sale orders and also the development land, you know, a preemptive right there, a real menu. You know, in our view, you know, really let's, you know, try and simplify this process. I mean, really the preemptive right seems to be pretty, you know, pretty useful. Uh, and do you need a right to register an interest in land if you've got a preemptive right? You know, why, why do you have these two devices? If there's a right to buy land, if it's in the public interest and ministers approve it, why do you need a compulsory you know, uh, 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 purchase order? You know, can we not simplify this list and give the key powers that are required and make sure that they, they're, uh, uh, it's simpler for communities, it's simpler for landowners? And I totally get the idea of diverse land ownership and empowerment of communities. But the reality is, for many communities, some sort of partnership approach with farmers and landowners would be perfectly sensible. Uh, and it might well be easier to progress because there would be a genuine partnership and there'd be multiple land uses. You know, and, and uh, you know, in woodlands and in some access areas, that would work perfectly well with other land uses. And I think that, you know, I, I regret that there wasn't, you know, greater uh, uh, emphasis on that partnership approach rather than purely just focusing on ownership, which you know, may be the right thing in many cases, but in many others, your know, partnership approach would actually be very positive for both parties. We Thank should you. be asking the Minister about these kinds of things just now. Uh, I'd like to wrap up this section and take a very short break. Um, so, Alec Ferguson and Alan Laidlaw. Um, thank you. I'll be, I will be very brief. I, I just want to really, I think, add to what Nigel Miller's just said. And if I could ask um, Dr. McLeod, if possible, very briefly, I, I, I am a fan of community ownership. I, I would like to see more of it in the south of Scotland as well. I've talked to Peter Peacock about that in the past. But everything I see here suggests a, a large bureaucratic process with a very sort of central guiding hand on it. And it, uh, why am I wrong in thinking that this is centralising a process that, to my mind, ought to be a very local one, because if you're talking about community ownership, community benefit, you're talking, surely talking about a process that should essentially be a local one in the partnership, working in the partnership, um, spirit of partnership, that Nigel Miller was referring to. Well, I, I think I entirely agree. It should be in, in terms of that uh, devolved local uh, context. But the problem is that, that, that government does have, a, I, I think, a, an important role to, to play in terms of facilitating that sort of opportunity. And I think providing resources, uh, whether it's in terms of financial support or other types of support, is an appropriate role for government to do in, in, in that context. Uh, providing a, the, the institutional framework to actually help to facilitate that as well is, is very important, I think, from uh, the context of, of what government can do. Because that then balance, well, what it does actually is two things. It, to begin with, it, it, it formalizes and brings to the centre of public policy, I suggest, uh, the issue of land reform, which has not uh, been there for the last 10 years or so. So it, it provides uh, an institutional impetus for that, which potentially could be quite monolithic and could be bureaucratic. Of, of, of course it could. Um, the flip side of that, though, is, is how you actually uh, design that and, and uh, make sure that it actually connects on the ground within communities in terms of the, the types of support mechanisms it, it provides so that it can then enable communities to untap whatever resources and potential they may wish they wish to utilise in relation to their own locally based development. And you can see examples over the last 10 years and before that actually uh, of where the engagement of uh, government policy instruments in terms of different types of support have been invaluable in terms of helping organisations to do that. So I, I don't accept that it's a, it's a, a kind of <coughs> top-down, heavy-handed, dead hand of government argument at all. I think it's actually something which can help to catalyse uh, potential within communities. Right, well, a sentence each. 
right? Or there'll be a sentence in the lot of you. Uh, Alan, uh, Peter and Andy Whiteman, and then we'll take a short break at half past two minutes. My, my sentence is that uh, it's got to be fit for purpose, as Callum said. You know, we've got to make sure that the willing activities of both the community and an owner or a manager or an interested party in the area can, can work because there are a number of examples where uh, uh, you know really good stuff has happened quickly and there's a number of examples where there's been w willingness on both sides and it's taken absolutely years and that really takes uh, a lot of the, the enthusiasm out of the community and the owner to, to make that effort so I, I commend that it's fit for purpose it's available to people to draw down when they need and, and it actually is firmly about delivery I think one of the points that was made last week was about you know the availability of that advice to, to the Highlands and Islands area versus the rest of Scotland and, and that's something that certainly South of Scotland is is in, in need of as well at times. Complex sentence, thanks very much. Peter Peacock. Well, uh, I just wanted to pick up the point Alec Ferguson made because I, I, I share, I, I would share his worry that this could become bureaucratic if it was allowed to. And the last thing we want is a heavy bureaucracy or a centralization of this, but I don't see it that way. I think this, these are enabling powers, liberating powers for communities to operate. Uh, and the last thing we want is, is bureaucracy. And I think in that context, Nigel Miller is pointing at some interesting questions that require to be addressed about how you keep this simple. And Andy Whiteman. Yes, very briefly in re response to Mr. Ferguson. I've always argued that all these powers, indeed the powers in the Land Reform Act, should never have been administered by central government. It should be administered by local authorities. I think it was a big mistake to do that. I think there's been big problems in, ad in ministers administering, you know, what is in the public interest of a small community in Kinghorn. Why should ministers get involved in that? You know, we have a very, very centralised state. I would get all these things down to the local authority and ministers' responsibility solely should be ensuring that these powers are being used in the public interest generically, so they have schemes that they operate that are fit for purpose. But the day-to-day -day administration and decision-making should be local, in my view. Well, thank you for that. We'll take a short five-minute break, and I mean that because we've got a lot to do, because that's only the end of question four. So we'll stop this now.
going to start on uh, thanking you, uh, agencies to support communities and oversee governance. Uh, Claire Baker is going to lead off on this one. Um, thank you, convener. Yeah, the report mentions the establishment of three agencies, one the community land agency that we've already um, partly discussed, um, a housing land corporation and a Scottish Land and Properties Commission. So I'd be interested in members' views on these. The one I'd like to make a couple of comments on is the Scottish Land and Property Commission. And I think um, you know, I'd be interested in what way you think that might respond to some of Peter Peacock's comments around recognising the principles of the report and uh, been able to define what the sense of direction is and for me it's also about establishing short medium long-term um, targets and, and plans for how we deliver on some of this another thing to mention in relation to that is um, the comments around the kind of 10-year time scale where we've not had in some ways not had a lot happening but in other ways the report has identified there is quite a lot of little bits and pieces happened in different parts of legislation but if we look back at the land registration um, legislation which was taken forward by Fergus Ewing at the time when you look back on the evidence around that, it was all, you know, I don't think Fergus Ewing recognised the significance of that piece of legislation for land reform. There was a lack of join up within government about um, what was actually trying to be achieved around some of these things. So in some ways, having the commission maybe gives us an opportunity to respond to some of that, but I'd be interested in members' views around the kind of three areas. And there's been a question raised about whether we need three. Um, do you think that is, do you think the three are, are necessary to have that um, level of creation in new bodies? Right. Who wants to kick off on that one? Nigel Miller. Um, I think we are totally supportive of you know, some form of land commission. And I think that uh, I suppose our plea would be that you know, under the Ag Holdings Review Group, you know, we're certainly looking at you know, either ombudsman or a, we've said an adjudicator. And uh, I suppose the adjudicator's role will be more about uh, uh, intervening when you know, land use or land management is inappropriate and making sure that that's sorted out. And, and you might have you know, you know, powers of compulsory purchase if that went wrong. Um, you know, it would be, if we're going to a land commission, it would make perfect sense to actually try and uh, uh, keep these roles together rather than having two or three different uh, uh, bodies you know, operating in the sector. And I suppose our view is very much that you know, how you operate uh, and the standards uh, of operation of, a, of, a, of a land holdings and uh, the opportunities they create uh, for others and communities and for the economy and for, uh, for the environment are the key things in this rather than the ownership. So we, we think that that, that, that sort of uh, adjudicator role is pretty important. Uh, as, as well as, as having an overview of, of obviously uh, uh, you know, the, the sort of ownership of land as well, which you're looking at here. Thank you. Uh, Derek uh, Logie, welcome. You're in. Thanks, Convener. Um, just I'll kind of confine my remarks to the Housing Land Corporation and the Community Land Agency. I mean, we said in our written submission that we welcome the, the promise of the, the Housing Land Corporation to become and deliver more land in a strategic way for for housing in Scotland and to help deliver targets for um, housing, both affordable and, and, and other, and private, um, private. Our main issue is in terms of scale and in terms of how the Housing Land Corporation works with, with small rural communities and, and delivers land within, within rural Scotland. Um, and there are certain caveats within the report which suggest how the Land Corporation is going to work directly with, with communities or, or help to understand local housing needs better. And if these things come through, then, then great. I mean, that's, that's, um, that's something that we look forward to hearing more about. But um, we'll need to more more detail about the Housing Land Corporation um, for the future. Um, things like it talks about the taking land into public ownership at a low but fair price. And we really don't have any kind of... Um, understanding at the moment as to how they plan to do that and how, how they will, will take that forward. So the kind of the devil's in the detail as it were um, and also we see a kind of crossover between the Housing Land Corporation and the Community Land Agency because that's the kind of level we're working at which is trying to help small communities buy a piece of land for housing and a lot of the time that can be on a voluntary basis or it can be sometimes trying to negotiate with a, with a landowner. So we'd, we'd want to see how it how it fits with that and, um, and it's when we have the more detailed um, understanding of the Housing Land Corporation will perhaps understand whether we need both of these agencies or not. Okay, that's a helpful one. Uh, Sarah Jane, uh, followed by Angus McCall. Just to respond to, to Claire's question about the Housing Land Corporation, um, 
in here it states that, that it's about the proposed function of the agency, and I think there's lots of the functions in there that, that certainly, as a, as a, as, a, as an organisation which represents housing providers, we would support. But our view would be that we actually follow the model which has been um, taken forward by Highland Housing Alliance, the Highland Small Community Housing Trust, and, and Derek Logie's organisation, Rural Housing Scotland, which is about rural housing enablers. I don't actually think a national top-down housing land corporation is how to deliver for rural communities. Um, I would like to see any... any Sort of funding or any appro um, approach for uh, affordable housing targeted at local delivery mechanisms where you have the community, based on community planning, based on community needs, working with that enabler, um, enabler model. So I have to say I, I, I don't see the merit in, in, in um, creating a new housing land corporation. I think for those of us who have been involved for housing in some times, the idea of a national housing corporation has, has probably negative connotations and we seem to have moved away in terms of rural housing from that national picture to lo meeting local housing needs. Um, I'm going to bring in Graham Day, uh, first of all, on a small point here before Angus McCall. Yeah, I'm triggered really by par partly by what Sarah Jane just said. Um, I just wonder what scope there is for bringing derelict plots back into use, because rural parts of Scotland are absolutely peppered with properties that have been left to fall into complete state of complete disrepair. Now, most of the buildings wouldn't be salvageable, and even if they were, they wouldn't meet sustainable current um, environmental standards. But I just wonder if we have a, can have a mechanism, and it would probably have to be a national mechanism, um, to acquire or encourage bringing back into use these uh, pieces of land for the purpose of housing. A couple of things, Graeme, that we could do. I think if you look at um, planning designations, something that the Rural Housing Scotland, um, Scottish Land States and others have looked at, it's a designation for affordable housing. So we refer to it sometimes as a rural exception site, and they tend to be bigger development sites. But if you could categorise that derelict site as a rural exception site, which can only be used for delivery of affordable housing, it deflates the market value straight away. So it's, it's not that people aren't sitting there waiting to get the most money that they possibly can. I think as well the rural housing enabler model I talked about, that's exactly what they do. They go around and they look to see what can be used to deliver local housing needs and they work to bring that land back into use. It's an excellent model which should be supported. And those two mechanisms, I think, brought together the planning, the, the, the enabler model and, if need be, the CPO powers um, can, can all be joined together to provide quite a coherent approach to, to utilising these plots in a better way. Um, Angus McCall, Peter Peacock and Andy Whiteman. And Derek, eventually, as well, yes. Thank you, convener. Um, we, we've been uh, a, a great exponent of, of the idea of, of a Lands Commission, and uh, in our original submission to the uh, Land Reform Review Group, we, we, we put forward the idea of a, of a Lands Commission, really not just to uh, act as, a, as an overarching um, monitor of, of the land reform process, but also to have a, have a few more, bit, bit more power in, uh, in interceding in, in problems on, on, on the ground. I think we, now that we, we are now embarking upon our, we're in the middle of the, uh, the first half of a, of a journey of a land reform journey, and I think it is important that uh, it's that there is some form of uh, cohesion to it. And I think I think we need to 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 make sure that rather than uh, conduct land reform measures in bite-sized chunks as we have in the last. Uh, um, 15 years that, that, that there is some, some overall sense of the, the direction of travel and I think that the, the, I think a, a, a lands and property commission is essential to, uh, uh, to, to take this forward but I also think that certainly in, the, in terms of the, the tenancy sector I think we do need some sort of Nigel's causes an adjudicator we've called it a commission or an ombudsman we need to have some form of, uh, uh, of interface uh, to make sure that we don't end up in, in the sort of legal wrangles that, we, that seems to happen in, in, uh, in questions of uh, in disagreements between landlord and tenant uh, and the, the, ver the various problems that beset the tenant sector. So I, I think as well as an overarching lands commission, I think there also need, need to be other various uh, other streams which they have, uh, have perhaps um, uh, not control over but c c can oversee what's What's, what's going on on the ground? Peter Peacock. We, we don't have a, a view in the Housing Corporation because it's not an area of direct expertise that we have. I've already mentioned we support very strongly the Community Land Agency. 
Uh, we would have liked to see it as a non-departmental public body, but we accepted in our evidence that there were other ways of that this could be achieved, and the Land Reform Review Group are talking about that as an internal to government agency using existing resources, so it needn't be uh, heavily bureaucratic or heavily costly, I don't think. On the Land and Property Commission, in the spirit of what I said earlier about what the principles that lie behind this report are, that if land, as it is being recommended, it should be, is a public interest matter, uh, and the case that's made in the report that, that there's been no coherent view of that public interest in the past, uh, at, really at any point in the past, and that therefore if you're going to look at this as a public interest matter and the common good long term, you require somebody keeping an eye on all of that, trying to keep it coherent, looking at where the market is changing, where public policy in other respects is changing, where we are meeting forestry targets, where we're not, uh, you know, is community ownership working, does the law require updating, all that kind of stuff. And it just seems sensible to have some uh, agency that is doing that. Now, that could be hugely bureaucratic if you wanted it to be. On the other hand, I don't think that's in anybody's interest. And there's no reason why it couldn't be quite a light touch agency, you know, meeting three times a year with commissioners or whatever on it and a bit of staff resource, uh, research capacity to keep an eye on all of this and report back to government and to parliament. So it needn't be heavily bureaucratic, but it does seem to have a very clear purpose in monitoring all of this long term and trying to make sure we continue to have a coherent view of land as a public interest and common good matter. Of course, inevitably, there has to be a land minister, a housing minister and a, a planning minister because they're all different departments. So the idea of a coherence in that sense, you know, makes rather interesting thinking. Uh, Andy Whiteman. Uh, yes, thanks, Convener. Um, I mean, the idea of a Scottish Land and Property Commission to keep an eye on all of this is eminently sensible, I think. I mean, we can see even in, in the report it covers an awful lot of areas that are not even within the remit of this committee, that are in the remit of at least other two committees in Parliament. Um, and a lot of things have fallen uh, in, the, in, um, in between the cracks on this in the past. Claire Baker mentioned the Land Registration Bill. Uh, the report makes a recommendation on common land, for example, which I'll be doing something about um, shortly, where a, a landowner on the borders has just stolen a huge area of common land, uh, and nobody knows, uh, nobody until very recently knew about it. So I think th th there does need to be some mechanism for keeping an eye on land as a thread running across a lot of areas of public policy, from housing to agriculture to uh, the marine environment, etc. On the housing thing, um, I'm not sure you need a housing land agency if you reform fiscal matters, if you reform compulsory purchase powers, if you've got these community powers, perhaps you don't need that. Perhaps local authorities could do that. But I do think there needs to be some means of going into the market and making land available for housing. We used to have new town development corporations. They were a very successful model. And if you go to continental Europe and Germany and France and Belgium, you know, you go and you buy a small plot of land and you build a house. It's got a very helpful table here in figure 19 showing actually that, you know, since 1930, we're now putting much more of our money that we borrow or have when we're building a new house into the land component, which is a completely unproductive way of using that money. Whereas on the continent, in Germany, in France, etc., houses are better quality because people are spending a greater proportion of the money they have on the house and therefore getting better quality, more long-lasting, energy-efficient houses that generate more jobs. So I think there's a lot in all of this. Thank you. Derek Logie? That, I would say in terms of land values, and it's one of the things that prevents any... I mean, I was on the board of East Lothian Housing Association for 10 years, and we never built one rural house because we couldn't afford any of the land that was around, around the villages. And, you know, we need, we need to look at land values, and, want, you know, we need to look at things like planning exceptions and sites, rural exception sites like um, Sarah James talking about. And just the point on derelict houses... Is another instance from it's, is that in certain areas, if you were to pull down that house, you wouldn't get permission to build a new one, because if you have a, you know, there's a, um, a presumption against any development in the countryside. So I think that's a, you know, you'd have to get planning right before you took that forward. Indeed. We'll be coming back to taxation and things like that slightly later. Um, uh, Patrick Krause and uh, Alan Laidlaw. Um, we would support the idea of, of there being a commission. Um, as you're well aware, we're one of the few, well, probably the only area of land in Scotland that actually has its own commission and is regulated. Um, I wouldn't wish to in, inflict the, the, the law that covers crofting on the rest of Scotland. Thank you. But our, our opinion has always been that regulation of land is important. Um, as Peter said, it is land is a, co is a common good. 
and crofters have had ample opportunity to state whether they wish to be out of regulation and constantly say no, for the common good it's important that we have this regulation and that we have a commissioner, a uh, commission with a board of commissioners that, that oversees how the land is used. And, and the model that the commission's moved on to is, is very welcome, it's more democratic, and they are um, trying to deal with things like absenteeism and long-term neglect. Um, I think they're under-resourced to do this, but, but I think the crofting regulation model is something that we should be looking at for the whole of Scotland. Okay. Alan Laidlaw. A couple of points on the, on the housing side of things. I agree with, with Derek in, in terms of a, a local authority approach makes a huge difference. You know, where it works really well for local um, exception sites is somewhere where we do a lot of business in Murray and there's a lot of things brought forward and it works really well to the point that there are more plots on the market than probably there's a market for at the moment. That doesn't chime with my own area of East Lothian, which is, uh, again Derek highlighted, you know, a completely different view. I think you have to, the, one of the recommendations that I didn't look at in great detail was that support for self-built. Um, and I think it's really important that there may be land available, but there are a lot of barriers thereafter. I have a plot with planning and a house at the moment. I cannot get finance for a number of reasons. And I think, you know, looking to unblock how people get the opportunity to build the house is, is also really important, and that would help substantially, I think. Tara wants to take this forward. <coughs> Um, no, I was just leading on to my, um, my, next quest, my question next. Um, a lot of the points that I was going to raise in my question have been covered. Um, I think Graham Day stole a bit of my question, <laughs> I'm afraid. But I mean, the review groups made several recommendations regarding urban renewal and new and existing housing, <clears throat> including a greater um, sort of emphasis on public interest-led housing development um, and self-build um, like um, Alan just mentioned, and also the introdu introduction of longer and more secure tenancies in the private rented sector. So I'd like to hear your views on these proposals in general, and in particular about what measures the government can take to develop a more vibrant self-build sector. And um, going back to the question raised by Graham Day, is the proposal to give local authorities the power to exercise compulsory purchase sufficient to bring um, derelict land back into use, or are further measures needed? Just for clarification, he was talking about the properties, but Aye. you're quite right, and we want that answered if yep. at all possible, without a doubt. Yep. So who's going to respond to that? Housing. Sarah Jane first. Pick up. I'll try and remember all, all the elements of your question. Uh, you may have to remind me during the thing. The security of tenure issue um, um, is referred to in this, and it's something that the private rented sector tenancy review group has has considered. <laughs> the recommendation we have made as a group to, to Scottish ministers is that we actually get rid of the, the current tenancy regime and create an, uh, yet another um, Scottish tenancy, residential tenancy, which would be clear, flexible and, and easy to understand. And what it would do is modernise the notice of, of, of proceedings for possession. So landlord and owner, uh, landlord and tenant are quite clear when a property would come back. And what that then gives is, is people um, clarity and security because they know that you know, if, if both parties are in agreement, the tenancy, then, then that, that's what they get at the end of it, and they get that length of tenure. The six months short of tenancy was always supposed to be um, used in, in circumstances in agreement. It has become the default, and neither landlords or tenants want that to continue. So I think that's one thing that we have to do. I don't think creating a, a new mandatory minimum tenancy is the way to do that, because that then becomes the default. What you have to create is a tenancy regime that works well for both parties. Um, that was one. Self-build, the first thing um, that the Scottish Government could do very simply for self-build in rural areas is reintroduce the Rural Home Ownership Grant. Um, it was an absolute um, disaster for that to be taken away from... from um, from, from rural areas. So that's a very, very simple, that doesn't require anything else about, uh, other than a reallocation of the, um, of the affordable housing um, program, uh, funding program. Other elements, um, you talked about housing in general. There's lots in here about meeting rural housing needs that Scottish Land Estates, Rural Housing um, Service and others have been calling for for a number of years. So we're delighted to see that the needs of, um, the housing needs of rural communities could be met in a much better way than they are at present. I hope I've answered some of the questions. Donald and Derek Logie, and if Cara wants to come back, certainly. Um. Yes, thanks, <coughs> Certainly pleased to hear Sarah Jane uh, mention uh, uh, 
need, need for the return of the rural home home ownership grant, and there's also the the, the Crofting House grant as well, which uh, which was um, ditched, uh, and it would always be good to see that back. But um, just following on from from the the, the, the a reference to, to self-build. Um, most of the panel members will be aware of the uh, Our Island Home Design Competition, which took place uh, quite recently, uh, and it was to uh, it was asking architects to design an affordable two-bedroom home, um, an eco home, um, that's easy to build and cheap to heat for uh, 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 less than a hundred thousand pounds. And I believe uh, the figure on the for the winner is uh, £70,000 uh, for, for self-build. So, I mean, clearly there's a lot of um, a support for that from, from architects. In fact, I believe there were nearly 50 a different designs submitted, which was uh, a healthy competition. Um, so, with, with so many architects ready and willing to, to, um, to, to get involved, um, what do you believe should be done to ensure that a, both... Um, uh, community landowners and private landowners actually go out there, pick up a trowel, and get building. Derek Loby first. Yeah. Yeah, um, thanks for the mention of our island home because it was um, the Rural Housing Scotland which ran that competition. We were really pleased to get as many entries. I mean, I think we're um, delivering that in two levels really one with community landowners who will develop housing for rent. And at the moment, though, we're restricted to the construction within Argyll and Butte because it's only in Argyll and Butte that the money is being targeted towards community landowners to build houses. Everywhere else, there's no possibility of getting any money, and that's because Argyll and Butte have soft seen fit to um, use some of their Second Homes Council tax money for this purpose. Um, and again, in other areas for self-build, um, for self builders to do the 70,000, they need two things. One is they need development finance, and a number of mortgage companies are no longer providing finance to help people get to the stage where it's completed. Never mind the fact the house is probably worth an awful lot more when it's completed than it costs to build. So the difficulty getting a self build mortgage. So what could be brought in would be development finance to lend money to the, the builder to, to get them to the completion point at which point they could then get a proper commercial mortgage and repay the government or whoever was lent them the money. And it could be a local authority that did this. Um, and secondly is what Sarah Jane was talking about, was rural home ownership grants. Because nowadays, with so much land in community ownership and with West Harris Trust, for example, giving, or not giving away, but selling plots for £15,000 at Luscan Tyre, then what we need is an ability for people to come and build their own houses on those plots. And at the moment, there's no grant or any assistance to enable them to do that. Okay, we have uh, Peter Peacock, uh, Patrick Kraus, and uh, Sarah Jane. It, it was really to respond to Mr McDonald's point about uh, community owners. We, we did a, a recent uh, piece of work, uh, an economic indicator study of 12 community owners. And I think the really striking thing came as a great surprise to us, actually is that perhaps the greatest activity that's gone on over the last five or six years amongst those 12 owners has been housing. So there's something like 300 units for housing had been achieved or are on the way to being achieved, either by giving sites such as in West Harris for, for, for low price, in joint exercises with individuals where the community gave the land but kept a share of the value through the land in the long term in the house, through joint work with housing associations, through direct building, through renovation of housing. So uh, the point, I think, is when community owners get a hold of the land, housing automatically rises to the top of the agenda because housing is the essence of how you can sustain your community. And there are, there are lots of ways in which the land value, because it is community owned and therefore has a social purpose, can be brought down and therefore housing can be made more achievable. I suppose ultimately in the urban context too, and in the rural context, it requires the will to intervene. And it comes back to this point about land being a public interest and common good matter, that it, that requires you ultimately to be prepared to intervene in the market. And I think in the report, it's such a big report, I can't remember where, but I suspect that the community sale order could be applied to land. And I think there's also talk of compulsory leasing in the report for those vacant properties and so on. But that ultimately requires a will to intervene to make these things happen. Okay. Um, Patrick Crowes. 
We really welcome the, the fact that self-build has been mentioned um, in, in the report. A, a lot of crofters of sort of my generation and, and older built their own houses. And we do, in fact, we do have um, a croft house grant at, at the moment. Um, but this, this replaced the CBGLS, the Croft Building Grant and Loan Scheme. And when, when the, the loan was taken away, um, we pointed out that the, that, that then limits people very much. Um, you know, as Derek was saying there, finance is really difficult to get anyway. On, on self-builds, it's almost impossible to get. And on croft land, it's, it's almost impossible to get. So the loan part of the CBGLS was really important. Something that I just wanted to highlight as well is that I think that, that um, between them, the, the Croft House Grant Scheme administrators and the local authorities aren't encouraging self-build at all. And, and for example, the Croft House Grant Scheme stipulates what sort of house needs to be built, um, and it generally has to be multiple bedroom. And what we want to see is starter houses where young people can, if they're willing to put the, the work in themselves, can build something that's to, to building standards, obviously, um, but can be done on a mo modular system. So start off small and gradually um, increase in size to make it affordable, because otherwise, otherwise the stipulations are put <coughs> completely out of the reach of, of young people in the crofting areas. Yeah. Well made. Uh, Sarah Jane Lang and uh, Andy Whiteman and uh, Derek. To answer Angus's point about what's stopping people uh, picking up the trowels, landowners and communities, um, I think there's probably two things. We, we did, a, 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 we created a, a, a grant scheme some years ago, Rural Homes for Rent, which was available to private landowners and community landowners. And the two things which stopped a number of those pilot projects going ahead and which continue to stop people picking up their trowels are prohibitive infrastructure costs in rural areas and restrictive planning. And I mean planning in its widest sense. It's the roads, guys. It's the lights, guys. It's, it's the, that, that whole culture. That's, what, that's what's stopping it. There's lots and lots of examples of where it's happening. I totally disagree with Peter that it's only a community land ownership um, issue. I, I mean, I, I think that when you look at well-managed estates, and certainly the research from ours, housing and housing for, to meet local housing needs is central to, to landowners, the, the, you know, the length and breadth of Scotland. So, so address those two things, prohibitive infrastructure costs and restrictive housing and countryside policies. Okay. To the bane of all our lives at times. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, we have had the planning minister here, uh, along with the uh, land minister, and it may be time to bring them both back together at the same time. So, Andy Whiteman and Derek Logie. Just very briefly, I, I agree with Sarah Jane on the infrastructure and all the rest of it in a rural context, but we've, the, the biggest thing is we've got a completely flawed house building industry. In, 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 the, in, in the country and in, in, in urban areas where we've got the majority of the market is volume house builders who make most of their money from land value uplift. They're not actually interested in building high quality houses for people uh, and it's speculative. I mean one of the best things to read on this is footnote 17 on page 134, Alistair Parvin's A Right to Build which won the RIBA Research Prize which basically talks about moving uh, the UK um, from a position where less than 10% of housing is self-built to a more normal European level, which is 50-60%, because that means that more of the available resources go into building high-quality houses. And it's no coincidence that when Passivhaus, which is a German standard, looked at their, I think they had a 50th anniversary recently, the number of houses built to Passivhaus standard in Britain was the lowest in the whole of Europe because it's volume house builders that build most of our houses, whereas in Germany, in France, and Belgium, it's people themselves, so they want high-quality houses. And then for just finally, in a, in a, land is still an issue in land values. In rural contexts particularly, no housing plot should cost more than 10,000. There's no reason why it should cost more than 10,000. And if you limited, find, find some way of, of, of doing that, people could invest their 70 or 80,000 pounds that they can borrow into very high-quality homes instead of sinking it all into land values. Hey, Logie, is that a solution? Yeah, I think so. I just saw Sarah Jane trying to get in um, there in terms of passive houses because Dormant Estate in, in Dumfries and Galway did build eight d passive houses through the Rural Homes for Rent scheme, which showed what an excellent um, um, scheme it was. Noid Art Foundation also built houses through the Rural Homes for Rent scheme, and that's the kind of thing we're, we're talking about um, um, re rebooting. Um, just to say... Something like, a, I think it's a, a quarter of the pipeline projects for the Scottish Land Fund are communities looking to do housing. 
um, housing is a kind of key um, issue for many rural communities in terms of keeping their school open, their shop open. It's a huge key rural development issue. And through the Scottish Land Fund, some communities like Alva Ferry have been able to buy land, negotiate it from an owner, haven't had to compulsory purchase it or anything or other. Um, and then it, or just broke ground yesterday to build two houses next to the school, which will do wonders for the school. Um, not so far away in Iona, um, the community spent 10 years trying to buy a piece of land from the Church of Scotland, um, eventually got that land, um, and, but are half a million pounds short of the construction cost because of infrastructure and planning related issues which mean they have to dig out the site to lower the roof heights and things like that so you know there's over a hundred thousand for five houses over a hundred thousand related just to directly to planning issues 350,000 related to infrastructure issues that's surprising they were allowed to build Iona Abbey um, <laughs> Graham Day uh, thank you, Kavira. And, and at the risk of taking this off at a slight tangent, I want to pick up on Sarah Jane's first point on the security of tenancies in a rural context and the very unique situation of estate tenancies. Um, not just tied properties, but you will have people who will rent uh, houses from estates. It's not like the normal arrangement where if you rent a flat in Edinburgh, you pay the market value, you know what your rights and responsibilities are between the landlord and the tenant. As, as, as you will recognise, in estates, you can have a situation where you pay a relatively low rent, but you invest in the property. You put in kitchens, you put in double glazing. You could live there for 20 to 30 years, but you have absolutely no security that reflects the unique nature of the relationship. And I just wonder if, if you would accept that perhaps that's something that needs to be explored to provide tenants in that position with a greater degree of protection. Sarah Jane was wanting to come back just now, and then Cara, to, if she wants to find any bits at all. Right. Okay. Yeah, sorry, right. Kevin. I, I think there's probably two or three things there. I mean, I, I think, first of all, there's no such thing as an estate tenancy. I mean, ten, estate tenancies have to operate in the same same. Um, situations everybody else so they have to meet a repairing standard they have to do everything else whether they're tied low rent way above market rent whatever you can get repairing standard leases and they are more common in, in rural areas they have to be at least seven years in 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 length and you have to have a clear um, agreement between the two of you so that that gives you more security than a normal short assured tenancy i think the improvement graham is a really really interesting point um, and actually i'm quite disappointed that the private sector group that stakeholder group has never actually thought about the improvement side of things rather than just because all we focus on is the repairing standard getting it up to the making sure that properties in Scotland are, are at that basic um, minimum there is um, at the moment council tenants housing association tenants have that right to improve and get that compensation back for it it's a very very easy to understand regulation you, you know how it'll work you, you know when you'll get your you know what money you'll get back at the end of tenancy I can't see any reason why that couldn't be considered in the private rented sector, but it'd be private rented sector in its entirety, because as I say, estate tenancies don't operate in their own little world, they operate within the short assured tenancy or, or even the old regulated tenancy regime as, as, as other tenancies do. So I think your, the improvement and making sure that people are compensated for improvements that they do uh, is something that can be looked at. The improvements though in, in the council, um, council setting and housing association are limited and they have to be approved by the landlord. I, th I think um, that, that's one thing that we'd, we'd look at. If somebody's had to pay to get their property up to a repairing standard, which isn't improving it, it's getting up to the basic minimum standard, then that, that is an issue and that's a failure for a landlord who should be taken to the private rented housing panel. Uh, Angus McCall on that point. Yep. Th th thank you, convener. Um, th th there is a, uh, quite a complicated crossover bet between um, uh, estate um, tenancies and agricultural tenancies. Uh, there's no requirement for an agricultural, to, uh, a farmhouse to, to, to be come under la landlord registration, uh, and there's no quality control as to the, the state of farmhouses and farm cottages. Uh, and it's, it's certainly it is the, up to the, 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 the tenant of an agricultural lease to, 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 to maintain and to repair his property. Uh, it's the state's, the, the landlord's responsibility to um, 
to, to uh, put, put good any uh, it, to, 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 to renew and, 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 and replace, but, uh, but there's no onus on the landlord to make any improvements on, uh, on, on, uh, on, on, on tenanted properties, whether it's the farmhouse or farm cottages. Um, therefore, unless uh, a tenant can be assured of uh, guaranteed uh, compensation for improvements at the end of, of, uh, of a lease, he's not going to, to undertake improvements to cottages to any great extent. Um, this is, is a, a real bugbear in the tenanted sector because, it, in essence, it means that um, landlords will, will, are often reluctant to give permission to, for tenants to, to improve their, their, their cottages or their, their farmhouses because that is not necessarily going to result in an uplift in rent. So, therefore, a tenant is, has to, generally speaking, has to improve his, his, his cottages and his, and, and his, and his, and his farmhouse uh, on, on the expectation that he, may, he might not get any compensation for it if he was to leave the tenancy. Therefore, unless you're in a long lease, there's no way you're going to, uh, to do improvements to, your, to, your, to, your, to any of your houses. And that this, is a, this is a real problem in the tenanted sector. And as we get into a more um, short-termism in terms of, of leases, there's less and less um, investment in, in, in houses and, and, and farm properties, as a, farm buildings as a, as a whole. Uh, and I think this is something that uh, you know, needs to be taken on board by, by this committee and, and by the Ag Holdings Group when, when they uh, um, do their deliberations. Just a final point on this then from Sarah Jane Lang. And, uh, yeah, and come back to that. Ang Angus is quite right that the, the property occupied by the, the tenant farmer um, doesn't have to meet the repairing standard. But every other property does, Angus. I mean, I think whether it's tied to you know, a, a tenant farmer's tractor man or the tenant farmer sublets it, those properties do have to meet the repairing standard. This is an anomaly that we have raised again and again, and I, I raised it recently in, in my evidence to the, to the, the local government committee on the housing bill. But I, I sensed a lack of interest in rural housing matters um, around that table. I do think it is an issue, that interplay between houses on, a, on an agricultural tenancy and housing legislation, which just doesn't understand ag tenancies. However, if a tenant makes improvements to houses, that is considered um, a, a wago. I mean, I think that's, that's quite clearly part of the compensation arrangements, and it, it is taken into consideration. To, to, to disagree over that one. <laughs> OK, well, um, we are at question seven now. Uh, on patterns of rural land ownership, and uh, Jim Hume is going to lead in this. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, part of the recommendations is that there should be a, an upper limit on the total amount of land in Scotland that can be held by a private land owner or a single beneficial interest, and the, the, the group actually recommend that the Scot Scottish Government should bring this into uh, law. Um, Unfortunately, the group didn't state exactly uh, what hectareage that uh, maximum amount should be. So it would be interesting to hear from the panel whether they think that the statutory imposition of an upper limit uh, would make a substantial uh, difference to land use. Uh, what, if they do, what that limit of hectareage should be. Uh, should it apply retrospectively? And I think uh, we've had problems with retrospective uh, legislation in the past here, obviously. Should it just be for new acquisition, uh, acquisitions? Should there be uh, punitive measures accompany the implementation? Would it simply be a charter for lawyers to make money because larger uh, landowners would perhaps uh, subdivide but have a, therefore have a group of businesses owning, if that makes sense? And uh, is this, uh, uh, is, is this uh, the, the right mechanism to address any issues that are out there or should there be other issues? Thank you. <coughs> we've got all day, have we? Discuss. Right, discuss. <laughs> right. Peter Peacock first. On it. I'm not sure I'm going to address the, the, the fine detail of that question, but it, to me this is one of the most important recommendations in the report, and it goes right to the heart of the public interest question that was touching on earlier. Uh, so we've already got the most concentrated land ownership patterns anywhere in the Western world, it is argued, and the evidence is that that is concentrating more now, is that in the public interest and for the common good, or isn't it? And to me, you've got to have a way of asking that question. I mean, for example, there was a piece in the Press and Journal in the, recently of a, a landowner who'd been uh, briefing the, the paper about that landowner's intention to move from the estate he currently owns in one part of the Highlands and buy up every other estate around it to create, uh, quotes, 
uh, an uninterrupted wilderness at the heart of the, the Highlands. Now, is that in the public interest? It could be. On the other hand, it might not be. The, the important point here is that we don't have any mechanism to formally ask ourselves that question. Ministers cannot formally say, or communities cannot represent the minister to formally ask the question, is this in the public interest? And to me, that's the essence of what the recommendation is about. You could argue about the size of holding. It could certainly be a trigger for the, asking that question. Uh, and maybe the mechanism itself has got limitations. On the other hand, how do we ask that question in any given circumstance in Scotland? And that, to me, is the important thing. Now, if you go to you know, wider continental Europe, this is not unusual. There are limits on land holdings, uh, and therefore you know, we would not be doing anything terribly new in international terms if we actually move to that. The UN, uh, uh, one of the, the big international bodies, the G8, have accepted uh, through the voluntary guidance on land tenure, and have, which, which is guidance to member states, approved by the member states, specifically mentions uh, limiting land holdings as one of the ways of securing the future of land in the public interest, in, that, in those terms for food security reasons. So there is international... Um, support for the concept of this, if you like. If you go to France, there is the, the, what's called the SAFER system, I think that's how you pronounce it, which is a public interest question that can be, a, that can be asked when any land transaction over a certain size, I think, and in relation to agriculture in particular, uh, it, it, before it's completed, then the state, either the local state or the national state, uh, has an opportunity to see whether they want to intervene in the public interest. So to me, this is fundamental to, to a fundamental question. It's not, I'm not going to get caught up in whether it should be 100,000 acres or 50,000 acres or whatever. In a sense, what I think the power of what the committee have, have said by raising that point is, how are we going to answer this question? And in fact, Alison Elliott herself said, you may have a different answer, but how do you answer the question that as land holdings grow, as they become more concentrated, I think she said the moral hazard increases to the public interest. So that to me is what's important. And the great thing about the recommendation is it brings that starkly into play. And we, I think we have to find an answer to that as a society. Are we simply not allowed to ask that question? What's in the public interest? OK, Andy Whiteman. Uh, yes, I'd agree with everything that Peter said. I mean, it's, it's curious that in a crofting context, um, you know, you're regulated to the hilt on five acres of bog and rock. Um, if you buy a, a washing machine under higher purchase, you have to fill in four pages of details, but you can buy as much land as you like in Scotland. You can stash it in an offshore tax haven and no one asks you any questions. And that's just a complete anomaly. So, I mean, I, I read this as a quite important principle that if you've got a finite land resource and you want to expand the number of people owning land and the number of people having a stake in land, it's perfectly reasonable to have a ceiling. Um, and if you want to figure, I would stick it at 1% of Scotland. I, I don't see why anyone should own more than 1% of the country. That seems, you know, already someone owns 1% of the country. Um, but if you want a ceiling, start, start there. Um, seems perfectly sensible. Nigel Miller, uh, Callum McLeod. 1%? 190,000 acres. I do the maths, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. No, I mean, we, we take your point, yeah. you know, but you've got to have some point where you start. Right, OK, so Nigel Miller. Yeah, I, I, thanks very much. I think the, this the section was prefaced by you know, the comment that once you owned land, you had the ability to control land use and you had total power, and that also you know, could uh, disempower all those around you if you had a, a, a large area of land. Uh, I suppose I would challenge that, that, that whole concept. I think your know, land owning is a uh, privilege, and therefore, you should operate within certain codes of practice. Uh, and if you operate in certain, you know, certain codes of practice for the public interest and for your community interest, and take those into account, and you take into the land use strategy, then in my view, there isn't a problem. And I think it goes to Peter Peacock's uh, comment about the public interest. If you're, uh, you're owning land and you're operating the public interest, and you're providing opportunities uh, and acts, and from our point of view in agriculture, providing uh, you know, long-term uh, uh, tenancies and things like that, and you've actually operate to the highest standards, then that's a positive. It's actually an opportunity for rural communities. Uh, our concern isn't the size of uh, land holdings, it's how they're managed, uh, and, and whether they actually fit these, these criteria and work in the public interest. And where they don't work in the public interest, then you know, some form of intervention you know, makes and capping makes certain you know, perfect sense. 
if they are operating in the, uh, you know, for the benefit of uh, the wider community and, and providing multiple benefits and, and, and working with, and I suppose the, the strategy in Scotland may change from generation to generation, but they're, they're actually uh, reflecting that, uh, then uh, you know, our view is that this, this isn't a particularly helpful concept, but I think it's a matter of you know, intervening where, 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 the, where they're failing to deliver. And there's real danger, as you say, especially, and we've seen it in certain areas where, where uh, communities are quite isolated, that you know, one landowner can have you know, a big impact on, on your know, community's ability to function. Uh, and uh, I think that, that's where we should be focusing our, our attention uh, yeah. and, and actually supporting uh, landowners which actually invest and, and provide opportunities and deliver you know, a, a spectrum of benefits. The Thank committee you. is listening to your views so that we can have a chance to you know, ask the minister about these things. And, uh, but it uh, means you almost need a codified you know, a code yes. so that people are, understand what you really require from them. Right. Uh, Callum McLeod, Sarah Jane Lang, Patrick Crowser. Um, the, the Scottish Government asked for radical and innovative proposals. I suppose this one certainly comes under the radical category. Some people might debate whether it's innovative or not, but I think the, the and, and I don't want to go, get into that, that debate either about pulling the lever and the answer is 42 in terms of what the actual um, number is in terms of, 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 of land, in terms of ownership. But if this report is about anything, it's about trying to put out into, into, into the public domain a set of principles which are going to uh, shape and assist the way in which the land reform process uh, evolves over uh, the coming years and decades. Um, there's almost a kind of tacit as, uh, assumption, certainly from, from, from uh, government in terms of, of uh, initiating this review, that, that there are challenges and issues uh, around the concentration of land in Scotland. So within that context, and I agree with Peter Peacock here, it doesn't seem at all remiss to be able to ask the question, is, or, is this a proposal which can help to actually address that? Now, there may be different ways of looking at that. Uh, Pip Tabor last week talked a little bit about other aspects in terms of uh, fit and proper persons to, to own land. There are some issues around that. And let's not forget, after all, that in terms of community land ownership, uh, communities get put through, uh, in terms of legislation, very significant uh, fit and proper organisation tests in relation to that. There may be a, a certain aspect that can be taken forward in relation to that. So I don't think the answer is 42, as somebody once said, but I think the question is certainly a very legitimate one to think about and explore in more detail. Okay. Uh, Sarah Jane Lang. Um, I'll, I'll try and be brief, convener, because as you can imagine, we, we have quite a lot of points we want to make in, in, in this issue. Um, as Nigel said, this seems to be driven very much by monopoly and, and control, and I think here that the Land Reform Review Group is, is, is confusing scale with that monopoly of control. We heard about East Lothian before. If you hold the only development land in East Lothian, you are controlling that far more than someone who owns 10,000 acres of, of the hill, rock and bog that was talked about before. <laughs> Peter referred to that, that large scale ownership um, approach to, to deliver certain land use. I have to say that sounded far more like the John Muir Trust than it did about private individuals. But, I, but again, that goes back to what Nigel was saying. It's the use of that land in that ownership's hand rather than the ownership which is, which is driving the, the issue there. Scale is, um, is an issue, but scale can be a positive. Uh, that's why you've got Storish US, you've got Noidart continuing to manage the estates that they had transferred to them at the scale that they got them at. It's seen as a benefit to them. Back to that, that arbitrary figure that, that was mentioned, um, it, it seems ludicrous to me that, that you'd, you'd place that purely, you know, any, any um, amount on, on acreage. So you could actually own the whole of Princess Street. You could own, you know, you, you could own the at the pocket of the highest level of residential and be the only landlord in, in the new town, but you couldn't own 10,000 acres of, 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 of Scotland. So I think we have to be clear as to what we're trying to deliver here. Is it monopoly of control of land use or is it just a punitive measure to, 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 to say, bad, you know, big is bad? Because the other thing that worries me in here is, 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 the, is the negative um, comments about growing farmers. I mean, we're, we're being, as Nigel said, we're being pushed to be viable, productive farmers, and yet there's a criticism here that farmers are selling land to other farmers. Surely that's actually a, a positive, that we're trying to, to, to ensure the future viability of, of our farming, um, farming land. So I have lots and lots of things to say um, about this section, convener, and we look forward to discussing it further with the committee in due course. Um, Patrick Crowley. <coughs> 
Well, I would firstly agree absolutely that there's an awful lot to say about this. And, and obviously this isn't the time and the place and, and we'll marshal our thoughts in the future. Um, something that, that I think is, is missing from this a bit is that it talks about maximum ownership. In, 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 and I think it also needs to talk about um, how many people are using our land. <clears throat> and I'm not saying that there, should be, that there shouldn't be a, a limit on maximum ownership. Logically, I think there should be a limit on maximum ownership. Um, as it says in the report, there are now some very, very rich people who, who potentially could buy most of Scotland. So, but this thing about how many people are actually on the land and using the land, an argument that we always put forward for, for, for the crofting system is, is that if you drive through certain parts of Scotland where there isn't crofting, there is no one there. And when you drive through crofting um, communities, there are lots of people there. But the point is that a lot of these, these crofters don't own the land. The majority of crofters still don't own, own their land. But they have protection, and that's, that's what's absolutely crucial about this, that the people that are using the land need to be protected. I mean, something, sorry to go into what may come up in another section, but um, something that was very significant, and it's mentioned in the report, was, was when the common agricultural policy um, started to become a very lucrative way of earning <coughs> money if you own land, then tenants started to get pushed off um, the, the larger estates. And, and this is a form of clearance that's, that's happening now. And, and I think that's something that's very much at the heart of this, is, is about the control and the use of that land <coughs> and who gets rewarded and multiple amalgamation, I'm sorry, but I don't agree with you over that. The, the farmers selling to farmers is about amalgamation. And, and these land masses get bigger and bigger, and more and more public money goes into fewer and fewer pockets. And that's wrong. Right, OK, that's a, a strong point of view. Um, Angus McCall, Peter Peacock, Willie McGee, and we're going to move on after that. If uh, Jim has some points to, to wrap it up. Yeah, so Angus McCall. Thank you, convener. Um, First of all, I, I quite agree with Patrick that, that, that there the needs to be control over land purchase. I mean, it, it, uh, I think we're, we must be the only country in Europe that, that, that doesn't exert some sort of control o over who, who, who buys land in Scotland. Uh, and I think the, 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 the accumulation of vast, vast acreages is, 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 not, is not, not, uh, not, not very helpful to rural society. Um, I, th I think... Uh, I, in many ways, I agree with what Nigel was saying, that it's, it's, it's not necessarily how the land, who owns the land, but it's, it's how it's, it's used. And I think in, in instances of very large estates, I think we, we need to have some mechanism of looking to see how these estates are being managed and to see whether they are actually being managed in the, in the best public interest. Uh, our, are agricultural opportunities being being, being used as much as they as they, that they could be used? Is the land being used to its to its full potential? Uh, are local communities able to uh, to do do what they they need to do? Uh, and in in many cases, you find that uh, there is there is a um, the the oh. areas that, where there is a, a, a an estate monopoly are not necessarily managed to their best advantage. Uh, and I certainly ha have a lot of concern ab about uh, this, this sort of increasing disconnect between the, the owners of the land and the, the people who uh, rent the land or, or who work on the land uh, and the, the, the group in the middle who are actually managing the land, the, the land agents, I think in many cases are not uh, that they're looking far too much at the, the bottom line rather than the, the, the profit line, rather than what is, is in the, the best interests of local communities. Um, we we have, have, have lots of examples of, uh, of land on, on uh, large estates which is not being used to its best ability. I think that a lot of it is, is being driven by, um, by, by CAP, CAP reform, uh, but there is far too much land that, that is being used more as a, as a sump for, for, for drawing in subsidy rather than uh, it's most, uh, how it could be most uh, used um, from, a, from a, a productive uh, point of view. Okay. Peter Peacock. Two quick points if I can. It's this question of use and ownership that both Sarah Jane and Nigel raised to some extent. I, mean, I think one of the good things, really good things, that the report 
draw us out is to debate that issue in the report and say, actually, you can't address the land question in Scotland just by land use, because there's a prior step, and that is ownership. And ownership largely determines the land use. In fact, they quote the Hutton Institute, I think, in, in a quote about they re them referring to the predilections of landowners largely determining uh, what the use is. So I think it's important to recognise that, and we support the Land Reform Review Group in drawing that point out. I, I, I guess my, my latter point is the point that Sir Jane was making about what's wrong with this proposal, and it's dead easy, I think, to pick up all sorts of technical things about how difficult this might be. On the other hand, if it's not this proposal, well, which proposal is it? Because the challenge to those who oppose any intervention, well, they've, they've got to say, is there not a public interest question that society can ever ask? And to me, that's the key thing. Uh, you know, are we simply saying that there are n simply no circumstances ever in Scotland that we're prepared to ask the question, is this man land managed in the public interest? I don't think that's a credible position, but there's all sorts of ways, no doubt, of answering that. And that's what we need to get into, I think. William McGee. Yeah, it uh, echoes Peter's point. Um, we, we don't have enough diversity in land ownership to see the number of different models of land use. We've got this flush of community ownership, which we're, um, uh, on, on current evidence, assured is, um, is producing more housing, more activity. We're not quite sure where that's going. But I think the point is that um, this opportunity given by this report and the, the, the kind of cut the, the zeitgeist, if you like, in Scotland at the moment is, a, is a, a real opportunity to explore new ways of managing land. And I, I, I agree with Peter that land use and land management, you, it's very difficult to separate them, them out. I have a question, just uh, very quickly, convener. Um, are, we're moving on to another section after this. <coughs> and we're moving, and so we're moving on to agricultural holdings. We are coming to that after taxation. After taxation, you're right. Okay, then I have nothing, nothing more Jim to say. Jim Hume. Asking the question on taxation in a second, but just to sum up, um, thankfully Andy was the only person who actually was brave enough to state an actual figure, and it was about 190,000 acres, so that was I think about 77,000 hectares. Um, but nobody really touched the part of should this be retrospective or it should just be new ac acquisitions. It's, it's very unlikely that somebody's going to be coming to buy 190,000 acres, but there are some, I suppose, we will have already got uh, 190,000 acres, but not that, not that many, uh, less than a handful, I, I would have thought. So, but, and, and Peter Peacock mentioned other European countries, uh, uh, and I believe some of the Scandinavian ones, or at least one, it's only about 700 hectares, which is uh, below the average size of a Scottish farm. So obviously uh, there's quite a, a difference in, in variety there. So we could have a whole week probably to discuss it, and I realise we have to get on, but I just thought it was worth summing up with on that point. Can we leave that on the table? Because yes. it most certainly is, but thanks for making it. Uh, mm -hmm. Alec Ferguson just... Could I, could I just make one point very briefly? Yeah, sure. convener. The, 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 the word diversity has been mentioned, and I don't think we should lose track of that, because uh, as I tried to draw out last week, probably very unsuccessfully, um, w we have some fantastic examples of where large estates work for the public benefit. We have examples of where they don't work for the public benefit. One of the things that really bothers me about such aspects of this is how you centrally determine what the public benefit is. Um, but I, I think... While I appreciate there is an argument about the diversity of land ownership, I would argue that we have an enormous diversity of land ownership in this country. I think that is a good thing. There are good landowners, there are bad landowners, there are good tenant farmers, and there are bad tenant farmers. There are good owner occupiers, and there are bad owner occupiers. It is all that is all part of the rich diversity that makes Scotland the extraordinary country that that, that it is. And I, I, the one comment I would make is is that if you take this recommend, I mean, if you take this recommend, if you believe that limiting the size of land that anybody can own is going to stop there being good examples and bad examples of land management and public benefit, then I think you're going to be hugely disappointed. Uh, just to end up this section, I would suggest that since we've heard from Patrick Krauser, you know, that we have a regulated market in crofting, it's always struck me that uh, in the larger landowner world that we don't have a regulated 
land market for land ownership as a whole. Uh, but anyway, um, Jim Hume, land taxation, payments and markets. Yes, uh, everybody loves taxation, of course. But um, the, the group mentioned that uh, <laughs> the, the group mentioned uh, that they thought the current fiscal regime needed to be looked at to encourage an increase in the number of landowners. Uh, obviously, there's, uh, I presume they mean smaller landowners. Um, one concern there, obviously, is how that affects the, the, the tenancy market and. Obviously, tenancy market is very important for uh, new entrants. There's very, very few new entrants that could actually start off as being a, a, a landowner. So we have to think of the future, I presume. Some of the, the recommendations they mentioned was ending the exemption of agriculture, forestry and other land-based units from non-domestic rates. Uh, I appreciate the government has ruled this out, but uh, we must remember that we're scrutinising the group's uh, report here. Uh, they also mentioned land value taxation. Uh, species-specific uh, sporting rates, uh, uh, to mention a, a few. Therefore, it would be interesting to hear from the panel what uh, their views on the impacts and proposed changes would have on rural land use. Andy Whiteman and then uh, <coughs> Willie McGee. Uh, Sorry. Yes, thank you. I mean, I think this is a very important part of the, of the report, and it, it highlights a number of issues that have never really been properly subject to much um, democratic scrutiny. Um, I mean, a very interesting comment was made by uh, a witness from the Institute of Fiscal Studies to the Scottish Affairs Committee when it was looking at uh, this question, which was that if you have generic reliefs, for example, they don't, they're not targeted. Uh, the cost of those generic reliefs is never properly totted up, as the recent National Audit Office report on tax reliefs pointed out. The original purpose for granting those reliefs is lost in time and the reliefs themselves get capitalised into land values, which then in, obviously, and quite understandably, get defended by those who currently enjoy the reliefs because it would lead to a drop in land values. So we're, we're in a difficult place with some of these things, uh, but I do think it needs uh, a very critical examination. I would just say on the non-domestic rates point of view, uh, there is no longer any rationale for exempting any non-domestic property from rates in my view. The original intention, the original reason why this was done in the 20s and earlier in England in the 1890s was because agriculture was, was having a bit of a tricky time so they got some relief and then that relief just became built in until it was completely abolished in the 1950s. And it seems to me very unfair from the point of view of equity that, you know, hairdressers and cafes and bus stops and garages and all the rest of it in a small town are paying what are fairly substantial rates of 47 pence in the pound notwithstanding the small business re relief scheme, and yet large areas of land around big farms, commercial forests, are paying nothing towards local taxation. And the interesting thing about this recommendation as well is if you introduced non-domestic rates to those properties that are currently exempt, of course you'd have to do it in a phased way, you couldn't just you know, do it overnight, uh, you'd have to do it in a phased way and possibly quite a long phased way. But the key thing is there for most payers of non-domestic rates, if you're to have a, a finite pot, a finite yield from non-domestic rates, you could cut their bills. And that seems to me an, of enormous attraction to rural businesses and urban businesses. And it's not just the exemptions, it's also large uh, exemptions that exist, for example, for industrial unused property. Uh, the building that went on fire a few years ago in Glasgow cost an awful lot of money, of money to, to put the fire out. The courts had to adjudicate on insurance claims and all the rest of it, paying no rates. Um, had it been paying rates, it had been paying about £750,000 to Glasgow City Council. And yet the owner of that property in the middle of Glasgow expects the fire and the police and the court system and indeed this parliament and people to, 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 to operate society to protect their interests and yet it's paying no contribution. So I think it's a very, very important um, point and I think essentially what the report is arguing is that we review these things. It's not making a clear recommendation on anyone but we review whether they're still justifiable. Thank you. Um, Nigel, uh, sorry, Willie McGee, Nigel Miller, Patrick Crouse, Sarah Jane Lang, Peter Peacock. <coughs> Deep breath. Okay. Um, yes, um, the first policy group, we, uh, again, we welcome the recommendations made in this section. Um, and specifically in relation to paragraph 20 and in, in, in sporting rates. Um, as it, as it stands, we have a, a red deer population in Scotland, which is something like three times that it was um, at the end of the Second World War. 
Um, the carrying capacity of the land has been far exceeded. We believe that there is not only a huge habitat and ecological damage, but there's also a large cost that's being borne by um, taxpayers, and that comes in the form of um, fencing, tree protection, stocking. So people who are harvesting wild deer um, are essentially allowing others to pick up the tab for, um, for their sport. Um, and we believe that sporting rates um, would be one way. We also believe in licensing because um, uh, slightly to one side, I think that in order to get a, a grip on um, issues such as wildlife crime, um, that sport should be licensed. Um, but the, the rates would allow um, local authorities um, and depending on how they were, they were collected, um, the public interest, if you use Peter's um, phrase, to reclaim some of the costs um, that are currently being paid for deer damage. Hey, thank you. Nigel Miller. <coughs> Thanks very much. This is uh, obviously a key area, and I, I obviously recognise this is reserved in many ways, but I think it's something that should be addressed by the committee. In reality, your know, tax and reliefs will actually you know, drive behaviours, uh, and uh, therefore I think this committee has a big role in actually looking about how best practice uh, and uh, opportunity can be driven by you know, a tax regime, uh, and uh, my own view is that uh, those that operate to best practice should benefit from reliefs. Those that actually fail to deliver wider benefits should not. Uh, and I think that that's a, a very political uh, question. The reality is that these, I guess, measures have been you know, looked at targeting uh, you know, uh, estates and larger farms. They would obviously ripple down onto all family farms. And if we look at uh, you know, land tax and, and uh, issues uh, at that level on, on, on an annual basis, and I appreciate the government's already intervened on business rates, if we look at uh, projected figures from HSBC, they're not our figures, you know, margins on spring barley, and it's a pretty crucial crop in Scotland and for the whisky industry, £26 uh, uh, you know, pounds per hectare you know, projected this year at 165 uh, per tonne, and we're into a negative margin if we go to 130 euros a tonne. If we look at uh, projections for whole farm projections for uh, upland stock farmers with maybe significant cattle herds on and the big sheep flocks, the net profit uh, uh, predicted after support, 14,000. Uh, hill uh, beef sheep units, which are on higher land, looking this year at a, a loss situation. The reality is if you actually you know, push taxes onto these farms, they, their viability and their continuity will be in question. So you know, before you look at tax, look at the impacts, look at the impacts on food, jobs, communities. They're, they will be significant. Uh, if you look at APR, you know, this is something which is meant to fragment land use. We've seen it used, uh, uh, or, uh, uh, or, or we can understand that uh, fairness would suggest that there shouldn't be a, a protection of the you know, heritable land. In reality, without that, we're going to fragmented holdings, which probably will not be viable in the future, uh, and real problems in, in, in getting our next generation into land. Uh, the, these are pretty crucial uh, issues, not just for farming, but for the sort of countryside we have and for our food industry. So uh, you'll look at it at two levels. This is a really powerful incentive we can use. It's also quite dangerous if it's targeted wrongly. Thank you. Patrick Krauser and then Dave Thompson. Um, I would like to first say that in, in our submission to the, to the group, we said that we agreed with the idea of a land um, value tax. So just to, just to confirm that point. What I actually want to um, draw attention to is that under the section land use payments, um, in the background there's, there's some some good context about the common agricultural policy. And under point 36, um, the group says, um, well, they point out that, that, that um, there's an increase in concentration to the ownership of farms in Scotland, particularly on the better agricultural land, um, and that the group also considers that the value for money in terms of public benefits from public funds for aspects of the CAP agricultural subsidy schemes should be much clearer than the case at present. And this didn't really get transferred into the recommendation that they make at the end of this, which is um, recommendation 43. So I just want to, to highlight this because I think, you know, this is at the heart of a lot of discussion that has been going on about common agricultural policy reform and so obviously it has its place there, but it has its place in, in this wider aspect of, of reforming land use in Scotland because what people 
what people sort of quite commonly, unfortunately commonly, um, pe people are, aren't equating CAP with public funding. I mean, common agricultural policy money is public funds. And so this point about having a measure of how well that public fund is used for, for public interest is really important to the whole thing. And at the moment, the common agricultural policy very much leans on um, providing more money to those that already have, rather than it being directed towards public good. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dave Thompson, uh, be reasonably brief about this, please. And, uh, yeah, thank you, convener. I mean, obviously, the whole issue of taxation is a very important one. It's a very complex one as well. And uh, <coughs> the, the Scottish Government has ruled out, you know, moving towards uh, um, taking away the exemption for, from non-domestic rates. The, the Scottish Affairs Committee, I think, have done a very good um, investigation so far in relation to these issues, but they've said they've got more work to do. And I would wonder, in fact, whether we shouldn't be um, asking them to have a very close look at all of those tax issues which are reserved issues, and we can maybe look at the ones that uh, are devolved and we can maybe work with them um, to come to some sort of clear way forward uh, eventually. I mean, looking at things like land value tax and so on, you've got so many taxes, and I think the thing with taxes is that if you're going to work a tax system properly, you need to be able to adjust and increase some and reduce others to, to get the sort of balance that you need. There's a lot of work here to be done. I would welcome you know, working with the Scottish Affairs Committee on this. Of course, we might not need them after the 18th of September, but there you are. So that's really the, 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 the main issue that, um, you know, I, I would like to just put forward. What, what do people think about a twin-track approach, if you like, between ourselves and the Scottish the Affairs last Committee two on people this? people who are going to speak on this one, Sarah Jane uh, and Peter Peacock, Peacock, unless there's something that Jim wants to come back on, no Did doubt. Just to agree with what Patrick and both Nigel said, you know, tax reliefs and, and any payments are there to deliver public goods. And if the tax regime that we have isn't delivering those public goods, then th there's nothing to be feared by, by looking at it. I think what has, to be, what has to be behind this is a driver to ensure that APR, BPR, everything else that we have is delivering public policy. That's why they were put in place and not driven by... Um, an underlying dislike of the people who actually receive those um, um, reliefs. And you referred to a lack of democratic review of the non-domestic rates recently. The Scottish Government has just actually reviewed that, and it was a full consultation and published its findings of that. So I'm not quite sure why, um, why Andy feels there was a, a lack of democracy within that, that, that process. But again, if we're going to look at non-domestic rates, let's look at it. There, there wasn't a sort of economic impact assessment. I, I couldn't tell you how much land would be classified as sporting um, under, under the sporting rates. I'm not sure that appears anywhere in there. Let's have a look at that. Let's, just, let's see what, what, the, what the extent of that is, what the public money is, and what the impact on any businesses would be. And again, for agriculture, let's, let's map it. Let's understand what the economic impact um, of, of, of any change would actually be. Land mapping suggests itself to me, but uh, anyway, yeah. Peter Peacock. Yeah, I, I, I was going to just pick this up as a point of principle. I mean, it seems to me that it would be a very odd report about land reform in the, in the comprehensive way that this report is if it didn't mention taxation. Because, as Nigel Miller says, taxation and changes in taxation drive behaviours, and that's what this is about, about driving behaviours. So it has to raise the question. I mean, I guess the political landscape is littered with the bodies of politicians who made the wrong decision about taxation. So I can see why, I can see why this is difficult for people, but in principle, you've got to be prepared to open these questions up if you want to bring about greater diversity of land ownership. Now, whether it's non-domestic rates or sporting rates or inheritance tax or capital gains tax or land value tax, I don't know. I mean, there's a, there's a huge debate to be had about that. The important thing is that the debate goes forward. And, and perhaps Dave Thompson's got a, you know, a point. Whoever is responsible for taxation, these matters have to be looked at in, re in respect of how we achieve our objectives for land. A few points here, and again, we could do another with another week on this. On, on this one, I was quite concerned when the, when the, the, the review group 
it came back to us last week that they hadn't considered the impact of of some of these changes on on on, on agriculture and of course you know that's some the major rural land land use it's also brought up a bit of an anomaly i mean andy whiteman said you know f farms don't pay any local taxes council ta uh, sorry local tax at all but of course the, there's quite a lot of council tax does come from areas and just come back to two or three questions uh, before there's a, a bit of an anomaly that you know, the, the farmhouse, if, if you like, especially a tenanted one, a tenant in a farmhouse doesn't have any rights uh, re regarding the, their housing, perhaps, as it's seen as a commercial property. The farmhouse is seen as a commercial property, but they pay local income tax and uh, council tax, uh, uh, usually quite large council taxes as well, because there's generally biggish houses. So, a bit of an anomaly there also. So, yeah. Complex, indeed. Mm -hmm. Okay, we move on to agricultural land holdings. Dave Thompson's going to lead. Yeah, thank you, convener. Uh, a couple of things here. One in relation to uh, crofting. Um, the, the report's recommending, you know, reducing the complexity of crofting legislation. Uh, I know there have been calls to consolidate the legislation, but that's a wee bit different to actually reducing the complexity. So I would, I would welcome some views on how we would go about that. It is a massively complex area at the moment. Um, the other issue about um, selling off government crofting estates at less than market value, what folks' views are on that, and the, the need for improvement of Part 3 of the, the 2003 Act. So that's the sort of crofting issues I would like to, to, to get some views on. And then on tenant farming uh, issues, um, where should the Agricultural Holdings uh, Review Group be going? There are certain recommendations in here. Um, should we be picking up on that and making some recommendations to them in relation to the, the suggested conditional right to buy and also removing the requirement to register interest so that it's automatic? I mean, is that, does that really go far enough? What are people's views on that? But let's take the crofting bit. And then, okay, Dick, that's absolutely right. Right, Patrick Krauser on the crofting bit, Peter Peacock. On reducing the complexity of crofting law, um, <laughs> the, the, the cut. <laughs> yeah, well, no, it's, it's probably actually it's probably actually quite quick. I think um, there's a there's a tweet from Jim Hunter quoted in the report that says. Um, scrap the legislation, start again. And I, with a clean sheet, I think he says, because every successive um, amendment m makes it ever more complicated. And my, my view on this, I'm, it's probably fair to say that this is my view and my recommendation I make in our organisation, rather than it being our organisation's view, is that were we to, to start a system of crofting now, I say, ask the question, would we, would we design a system of legislation that we have? And the answer clearly is no, of course we wouldn't. So the logic there is, is start with a clean sheet. And I know there's, there, there are, um, well, the, the, the 2010 as amended, as amended, um, or is it 93 as amended, as amended, as amended, as amended, um, is being looked at, and there's a sump um, collecting the anomalies in the, in, in the law. Um, it started off with a view being given that this isn't about amending the current legislation. It's about trying to work out whether there's tweaks in that. I think having... having participated in the collection of the sump, um, I think they realise now that the sump is so big and full of, of very serious flaws in the law that, that I think we would be recommending that, that we start again. And I know it's, it's constantly said, Parliament will not want to touch crofting again. It has to touch <laughs> crofting again, because, because the 2010 made things worse rather than better. Um, on the selling of crofting estates, it's an interesting one because this is one that the group came back to us asking, why don't crofters use the, um, the, the 98 Act to buy estates that are owned by the ministers? And to an extent, it's because um, tenants on these estates have a very good landlord. 
and, and they have the protection of crofting law. Therefore, why, why change, change things? Um, whether you could sell estates under um, the market value, this is a huge discussion that I don't know the answer to because, because the, um, the ogre of um, state aid rules is always wheeled out at some point when there are discussions about this. And it seems to be really difficult to get definitive answers about state aid and, and what... Asking the Minister about these, these yeah, matters next exactly. week, although I doubt, yes. you know, and state on, aid's and on Treasury part three, um, there, is, there are particular points. I think, I think the, um, the report covers them all, actually. The main ones being thing, things like this complexity of mapping that's asked for under part three, that in no other um, sphere is this complexity of mapping ever asked for. The registers of Scotland don't have maps like, like they ask crofters to produce. It's a, it's a complete nonsense. Um, a point that didn't come up in the report that we made in our submission was that the, um, the organisations involved in both part two and three need to um, have a, a structure um, as we said, and the, re and the report says, that there, there needs to be different constitutions looked at. But an important thing, no matter what the corporate structure is, is, is that these organisations need to be um, democratic, as we said in our submission. In, in the, the third sector, um, third sector organisations have to have a rollover of directors, for example. And for some reason, community bodies, I think, missed out on this. So just looking at how to implement this would be good. Right, well, thank you. Peter Peacock, Callum McLeod, without going over the same ground. But just three, three points very quickly. If you could simplify clofting law, absolutely, but hopefully you can pass it to the next generation and I don't have to write any evidence papers on it because I, I, it's very, very, very difficult. But I, I, it's an objective we certainly should have. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, on, on the crofting estates uh, point about should, there be, should it be possible to do that at less than market value or at nil value, absolutely yes. And in fact, the Scottish Public Finance Manual does permit that technically, but the incentives for the person that has to make the decision are disincentives, they're not incentives. And I think, and in fact, I know the Scottish Government are trying to look at how they interpret that and how they make it work. But in principle, absolutely, it should be possible. Uh, I, I, would, I do want to stress this, though, that I don't think there's any way that we should be seeking to force croft or crofting communities to take estates. It's absolutely got to be up to them. If they want to do it, and that has to be their clearly expressed will, then every facility to help them should be given. But we can't force people to do that. We're strongly of the view that no community, crofting or otherwise, should be encouraged against their will to be around this road. They've got to want to do it. Uh, part three of the Act... Uh, absolutely necessary to, to simplify that. The mapping requirements that Patrick referred to are completely tortuous. There is no particular reason for them to be there. They wouldn't be required in any other facet of our uh, transactions over land. So absolutely simplify it. But the ultimate power of part three is vitally important about the actual right to buy because that is what is giving rise to the negotiations that are now taking place, particularly in the Western Isles, for the transfer of, of significant areas of land uh, into, community, into community hands. It's being negotiated, but the power of the Act lies in the background to help facilitate that. Paul McLeod. Uh, to simplifying crofting law, uh, last time uh, we... I was here, I had uh, the eminent crofting lawyer Derek Flynn by my side, and uh, he's not here now, so I'm going to skip that particular uh, question. But in relation to the transfer of crofting estates, um, only, the only one organisation has actually done that, West Harris Trust, uh, I think they found it possibly akin to uh, something out of a Kafka novel, basically. Uh, they had problems in relation to, uh, or, or challenges in relation to the ballot. There are all sorts of issues around. Um, Aspects of, of swilling public money from one from one organisation to another doesn't seem doesn't seem sensible at all. So if that can be done at below market value, I think there's a very strong public interest um, motivation to do that. And state aids is certainly uh, a loosening of that would be um, relevant in relation to that. Park in relation to part three of the um, land reform act is the only example of, of where we've seen that thus far. Um, I mean, if, if, if 
West Harris Trust had, had something of a Kafka novel. This has taken it off, off the scale, frankly. Big issues around mapping. But there's also one other issue which I think is important too in, in, the, in the general kind of uh, sphere of what we're talking about here in terms of land reform. And that's around uh, human rights because there was a challenge, obviously, in relation to uh, the human rights issue with regard to the uh, legitimacy of the park um, attempted by it. And, and, and that was found not to be in contravention of that. And I think that's a very strong message in terms of uh, broader human rights issues beyond that of the individual, which are obviously very important too, but I think there are implications in terms of broader issues around land reform in terms of that. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Jane Lang. In terms of the, the crofting landlords, uh, as, as Patrick knows, um, uh, Dr Jean Balfour, who, who chairs our, our, our crofting group, I always bow, I have to say, to, to her greater knowledge when it comes to crofting. Being a lowlander, she t tells me I'll never understand it. But I have to say, crofting landlords are, are completely on side with this about the need to, to, to simplify um, and make sure that what we have is, is, is fit for purpose. I think if you're going to look at specifics, the paragraph 34 um, relates to this, this ridiculous situation you have just now. If someone makes a minor error in omission, their application is thrown out. Um, we firmly believe that that should be rectified w w without delay. Um, it, it's caused a number of, of, sort of willing seller, willing buyer things to fall at the first hurdle, and the cost to the, organize, uh, the, the, the people involved has, has, been, has been horrendous, as, as, as Patrick said. So I think that's something that we can, we can do um, straight away. I think park is something that we can all look at and take real lessons of how not to do things. I think ev everyone is, is quite clear. And that also includes the transparency and speed of decision making by, by Scottish ministers. I think it's one of the things that that shone a light on. And if we're going forward with land reform, I think that has to be um, addressed in, in any, any element, whether it's part three or whether it's an extension of rights under part two. Thank you. Uh, and finally, two people for this section before we move on to agricultural holdings as such. Angus McCall and Wally McGee. Thank you, Kavina. Um, ju just a, 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 a small point about um, the, the anomalous posi position of small landholders who fall between the two stools of ag holdings and, uh, and crofting law. Um, they, they, they've, uh, they, they haven't had any changes to, to, to the legislation since 1931. Uh, the, the, uh, until the, the Crofting Acts in, in 2007 to 2010, um, the, these Crofting Acts tried, Crofting Reform Acts tried to um, make, make a pathway for small landholders to convert to crofting status, because as, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, the, um, uh, the most small landholders missed out on being designated crofts because they're, they're in, the, in the wrong area and the, the, the Duke of Hamilton made a very good job of making sure that uh, the Island of Arran didn't get uh, um, uh, crofting status. Uh, so the, 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 what, what has emerged from the, the, the Crofting Reform Act is a totally unworkable piece of uh, legislation where the, 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 the process of trying to convert to crofts um, particularly if you, if you, if you have a, a, an, an unwilling landlord, is, is almost impossible. Uh, and the, 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 the two crofters who've tried it, uh, the two la small landholders who've tried it, uh, have, have really had, to, uh, had to, to, to give up and try another route. Um, we, we, we recommended to the, uh, um, the Land Reform Review Group that these, these small landholders should be uh, allowed to, 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 to um, rather than go down the crofting route, should be able to have the ability to, to purchase their small land holdings directly. Uh, and in fact, th th that was a recommendation made on the island to, by, 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 by Sir Crispin Agnew uh, when he, he, he came over with us to, uh, uh, to talk to small landholders. Uh, I'm glad to see that the um, the, 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 the review group has recommended a statutory right to buy for, for crofters, which I, I for, for, sorry for small landholders, which I, I think is, is only the sensible thing to do. They have also recommended that it be on the same basis uh, as, as, a, as a crofting purchase, i.e., 15 times the annual rent, which is far more sensible than the convoluted. Um, process uh, at present of trying to, to ascertain the value between small land holding status and, and crofting status, uh, and then they have to convert to crofts, and then they have to, to apply to buy the, buy, buy the land. Uh, so I, I, I commend the, uh, uh, that, that recommendation from the, the, um, the review group to, to you. Thank you very much. Uh, Wally McGee and Patrick Krauser <coughs> to end the crofting bit of this question. Uh, very quickly, it's about Tenant Farms, Section 28, um, Forest Policy Group. The, um, we 
believe there's an omission there, and that's in respect of the tenant farmer's right um, to woodlands and trees on a tenanted farm. We're undertaking a piece of work at the moment to, um, to look at the, the, the willingness or otherwise of tenant farmers to put more trees, manage more woodlands on tenant farms where the, the situation to be uh, otherwise. Nigel mentioned um, something that's ongoing just now, so we'll be taking that up with um, NFU and with uh, the Tenant Farms Association. Okay, thank you. Patrick Crowser. This is the very last thing. Um, I just wanted to, to, to bring up the identification of the parties involved in, in um, land buyouts. Within crofting law, a, a, a crofting community is defined as, as one thing, and then under the land reform, a crofting community is defined, defined as something else, and I think this needs to be, be sorted out. And then also, under part three, a crofting community um, can't then make an application to buy under or register an interest in buying under part two. So just a really strange anomaly that that same community has to redefine itself and, and set up a whole new um, community trust. So that, that needs to be sorted out. And, and then the last thing was about identifying land, landowners as well. I think there's a problem with this. Um, Andy mentioned um, you know, some companies owning land and how difficult it is sometimes to track down who that company actually is. And um, there was an example also in Shetland of, of some land being sold in auction and being resold and resold so rapidly that, that it was never being registered and the crofters there have no idea who, who their landlord is. So that needs to be sorted out too. Thank you very much. Uh, to Dave's question to the agricultural sector, you know, the Land Reform Review Group have made some recommendations. The Agricultural Holdings Review Group, you know, will be in a position probably that they should listen to that. So I guess both Nigel Miller and uh, uh, Angus McCall want to sort of lead on this one just now. So we we'll start off with Angus and then Nigel. Thank you, Convener. Uh, from 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 our, our from, from our perspective, I, I think the the uh, Land Reform Review Group have have done have. Uh, made some very common sense uh, suggestions that they, they, they haven't gone into any detail and of course you wouldn't expect them to go into detail but I think that what they are broadly suggesting I, I think uh, chimes exactly with our thinking uh, and I, I think we, we're, we're, we would fully support it. What we would hope is that uh, the, the what the, 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 the Land Reform Review Group have, have said about ag holdings will be, take, will be seen as the context uh, in, in which the, there should be reform carried forward by the uh, Ag Holdings Review Group. Um, I, I think that there, that there are two separate reviews. One's an independent, the other one is a ministerial-led one. But I certainly hope that the, the Ag Holdings Review Group under the Cabinet Secretary would pay particular attention to the recommendations of the uh, land, land Reform Group. Um, the one that their first recommendation was the, to do away with the need for registration of interest to buy land. Uh, and I, for, for the life of me, I cannot understand why it was ever brought, brought in in the first place. Uh, the, the, the area of land is usually fairly, fairly well uh, defined. Uh, and the, 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 the requirement to, to, to register is, is just uh, is, um, superfluous to, 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 to our way of thinking. Um, the, the registration of interest does not guarantee the accuracy of, of, of the registration. So what can in, in effect happen is that a landlord can, can, can put the, the, the farm on the market uh, and then challenge the, 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 the tenant's re registration. So it's no, it's no guarantee to the tenant that, that his, 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 uh, his preemptive right is going to, uh, to, to um, uh, go ahead. Uh, it also there are um, about 1,300 registrations on the on the, the, the register of Scotland. About nine, uh, there are only about 900 or 950 of those which are still live. Um, some of those will have dropped off because of the the requirement to to, to re-register after five years. Some of them will have dropped off because of challenges. But uh, the, the, there there are many more. To, I mean, the majority of tenants, given their, uh, the, the offer of a, of a 
of a preemptive right to buy the farm would, would, would take it up. But a lot of them have not signalled their, their, their interest uh, really because of, of the, the, effect it, the, the effect it has on, on the relationship with the landlord. Uh, and I think that, that the, certainly the, the, the need to the, the need to, uh, to, to, to register an interest is is is, is, is shouldn't be there, and uh, I welcome that suggestion. Um, regarding all the, all, all the other uh, the, the other comments that the land reform group uh, group made, I think a bit like crofting, uh, we're really looking at at uh, maybe starting again with a with, with a with a clean sheet. Um, we do have an agricultural legislation which is incredibly complicated. It's nearly as complex as, as, as crofting, uh, and uh, it, it suffered from, from, from years and years of, of amendments. And if you, if you try and look up a legal point, you need about six fingers to put in six different books to, 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 to cross-reference. Um, I think that what, what we're needing is, is some form of, uh, of perpetual tenancy for, for, the, uh, for the 91 to secure sector, uh, I think they, they have indicated that, that sort of direction of travel with, with talk about assignation and so forth. I think we need to have um, more flexible <coughs> models for, for, uh, for, for, for renting land for, 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 to allow new entrants in. Uh, and I think we, we also need to have some, some conditional right to buy uh, inserted, not necessarily for the whole farm, but uh, the, the, the ability to, 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 to purchase house and, and steadings or, or, or bits that are needed for a diversification enter enterprise and so forth. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. I think, Angus, um, yeah, I don't want to uh, curtail debate because obviously uh, it's important to hear each of the sectors. Um, perhaps Nigel wants to respond to this just now, first of all. Um, I think we're fairly close to Angus, to be honest. We support the you know, preemptive right being automatic, and we support that these recommendations go to the Ag Holdings Group, and we think you know, that's a, a, you know, that process is, to us, working well. So, thank you. That's good, thank you. Uh, Alan Laidlaw? I haven't heard from you for at least an hour, I think. <laughs> that's not your fault. <laughs> I was being brief as requested, uh, convener. I think Angus's point about the, the flexibility and the, and the sort of functionality of the legislation is key, because the last thing anyone wants, uh, and, and the, the, you know, the area that got greatest concern last week was a charter for lawyers, and you know, whether it be crofting or ag holdings, it gets very complicated very quickly. Um, and I think we need to make sure that all legislation in this area is fit for purpose for, for everybody involved, because what is actually happening is there's, there's, a, there's a sort of um, delay in being able to get things done that both parties want. And I think that flexibility and that pragmatic sort of fit for purpose legislation would be of huge benefit to the sector and to the relationships. You know, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that... Um, landlord and tenant must work in partnership to deliver the most that they possibly can from, from the interest. And I think at times where we're at, at the moment, there's, there's a quite a, a difficult uh, dynamic can develop because of the legislative process. Um, I think, um, uh, you know, in terms of the, the right to buy and that sort of things, I think that's a, a matter for the review group to, to take forward further. But I think we just need to be realistic about not the point that Patrick makes, not everyone wants to buy their asset. Not everyone wants to, to take the financial uh, commitment of, of purchase, uh, you know, and various other reasons. And I think we, we need to make sure there isn't a, one prescription for everybody. Um, you know, there's some fairly re robust sort of views from, from others that that's not the, the only holy grail. Okay. Um, we've got uh, Alec Ferguson and Sarah Jane Lang. I, I just want to make a very brief point uh, to put on the record, really, convener, that I, I'm slightly disappointed that the review group looked at this issue, just as I'm slightly disappointed it made recommendations on deer management and wild fisheries, because these are all areas where there is considerable um, work going on at the moment with specific uh, groups of expertise to look at these issues, and I think it would have been uh, a more helpful position at the land. I can understand that they wanted to mention it, but I think it would have been more helpful and more conducive to a positive outcome if the review group had simply said, recognise that there is a lot of work going on in these areas and left it to those specialist organisations to report. I don't expect that to be a wildly popular position around this table, but I wanted to put it on the record. But who knows? Um, uh, Sarah Jane Lang. <laughs> I don't want to get into to sort of technical specifics. As, as others have said, we're, we're feeding those into the Ag Holdings Review, and I'm sure we'll be back 
back again very soon to discuss the interim report and the final report from that group. But just a, a, one thing that struck us from, from this section was, reading through it, I was unclear what the group was trying to deliver. Is it perpetual tenancies? Is it churning the sector? Is it turning tenants into owner-occupiers? And then reading back, why would they want to turn tenants into owner-occupiers if they're saying that the tenant farming community is the one that tends to sky, uh, score high in the social measures that they're trying to achieve? So I think it's maybe reflective of other parts of it. The vision that they're trying to achieve or the picture they're trying to achieve isn't clear. So you, you do seem to have contradictions within the section in terms of ag holdings, convener. Thank you very much. Um, Dave, I think we've, we've exhausted that at this stage. Very good. Um, I'd just like to sum up on timescales and interrelated recommendations. Um, we have uh, heard a lot of ideas about um, whether land ownership is the key determinant of how land is used and there's been strong evidence on that. We're looking for realistic time uh, scales for implementation of the review's ideas. Uh, there are recommendations, uh, obviously, need to be made about which parts relate to each other um, and uh, what cumulative effects uh, the implementation of the Land Reform Review Group recommendations would be, uh, because we have to think about the future and how it all pans out. So there's a process issue here, and uh, I wonder if anyone has final thoughts, you know, very, very briefly about how you think we should take this forward. I would just suggest that we need several work streams and uh, that uh, perhaps you might want to concentrate on that approach when we then question the minister in a very interim sort of way. Okay, so Sarah Jane Lang and then Peter Peacock. Start. Convener, I would agree. I, I think we, we, you can't tackle it in its entirety at one stage. I think as well as looking at work streams, I would suggest a sort of matrix approach to things that we know we can do now, things that we, we you know, are, are sort of medium term and things that are going to take a long time to, to really think through. And I think, I think work streams, but that sort of short, medium and long term approach is, is something that we would, we would recommend. Peter Peacock? Well, I, I think uh, that there's some things that, that could be advanced, particularly in the community ownership section, uh, because the Community Empowerment Bill is already going to deal with um, amendments to the Land Reform Act. Uh, and our view would be that the government should get on as quickly as they can and consult on that and try and use that vehicle to maximum effect. Now, what exactly maximum effect is, we just have to, you know, we have to tease that out a bit. But I can see a number of things that the government, given the timescales of that bill, could impact on through that bill. But that's really around the community ownership stuff in particular. Uh, on the other stuff, there's clearly other things that require to be uh, considered and worked on, and there are probably different timescales attached to them. And there's some, I think, recommendations about things going to the Law Commission, for example. But I think the important thing is that this doesn't get into the long grass and that we keep it as a very clear political... Uh, I'm using political with a small p context, but a political matter that requires to be dealt with. For all the reasons the review group set out, this is about change uh, for, the, for the common good, and therefore we can't allow it to disappear off the agenda. My own hope is that the minister will, over the next week or so, set out, hopefully, how the government want themselves to handle it, and then we can all respond accordingly. Thanks very much. Um, that's very useful. I find myself in the position of always coming back to the diagrams on page 176 of the report. That's the one about the prices of different types of land. And the one below it, which is even more important, the price of land compared to other commodities, which uh, you can find shows that the best thing to invest in in the last 10 years was gold. The next best thing was Scottish and English farmland. The next best thing after that was FTSE 100. And finally, uh, you've got UK house prices at the bottom. If Scottish and English farmland are the second highest uh, return levels, <coughs> there clearly is something that suggests that this land reform review is urgent because it cannot be related to the economic value of that land. And uh, so that's why the question about the sale of land and the uh, use of land are interrelated. And I, I say these things, you know, making bold statements, but, you know, I cannot see any other outcome when you look at that diagram uh, as to whether or not these things should be taken separately or not, whether Scottish land and estates say it's all about how land is used, 
No, it's not, because clearly land is a huge value and that therefore we have to have a balance in all these things. And I hope that it's going to be possible for us, uh, most certainly, uh, to make sure that uh, the Minister gets us a clear timetable as early as possible and you will indeed have a great opportunity to contribute to that next stage. I'd like to thank you all uh, warmly for the way in which you have made sure that uh, we have the points of view here for the committee to mull over and I hope that we get our uh, chance to get the official report at an early stage this week because there's a lot in it. It's been a long meeting. Thank you very much for your attendance and just before we close let me say that uh, the next meeting is on the 11th of June. We'll be starting at 9.30. Uh, the committee will take evidence from the Minister on Land Reform Review Group's final report and we'll be interviewing the UK Fisheries Minister George Eustace uh, on marine and fisheries issues. With that, I close this meeting.